regret something I did So I caused a second great depression What can I say? I guess I got a bit carried away If I say I'm sorry will you give me the money? But you know me, the complete banker in a black Bentley Sweet Samantha riding next to me Watford, hello John Hi there Nick John Hi Yes John I just wanted to ask the question regarding uh, Rishi Sunak um, and and his wife's tax affairs. Yes. Um, ev- everyone seems to be having quite a lot of a go at her for what she's doing, but the we're, rules... We're being mean. Oh, I wouldn't say being mean. It just seems to be a bit inaccurate. People are saying that she's paying 30 grand to to be a non-dom. Yeah. But actually the, the domicile rules are because she was born in India. That's her domicile of origin. Now, because she's come over to the UK, you're allowed to have seven years where if you, for example, let's say you came over and you worked here and you you earned income, the salary that you earn here in the UK, you would pay tax on. Yeah, there's a box box on the form and she ticked non-DOM. It's not by accident. It's not because those are the the, rules. She chose to be that. No, uh, Nick, it's called the remittance basis. You can tick to pay tax on the remittance basis. John, I've uh, read about a dozen times today various tax experts saying that it was a choice that she made. She made that choice. It wasn't visited upon her. She wasn't some helpless individual who couldn't uh, choose one way or the other. No, you can choose to be to pay the tax on a remittance basis. Only the income that you then remit to the UK your overseas income that you remit to the UK, you pay tax okay, on. Okay, like I, my, my eyes are glazing over. This, this sounds like accountancy uh, wonkery. But to tell us the, the it of it, uh, she's um, been unfairly maligned. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I think that it's just sort of inaccurate, that's all. Because if she is here for um, over seven years, she has to pay 30000 If you're here over 12 years, um, you're a non-dom, but you're resident here, tax resident here, over 12 years, you have to pay 50000 And then you can only claim non-DOM residence, tax residency, um, up to, se- I think it's 17 years. And then you have to pay everything, all your worldwide income, on an arising basis. As for the inheritance tax piece, oh, if she's here God. for 15 out of 20 years, then her worldwide estate will be taxed for UK inheritance tax. Right. Just- and none of that um, actually lodged with me at all, John. So boring. But... I think the it of it is she chose her current um, or what used to be before she said before before she volunteered to pay tax. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, that uh, she it was a a a, a mode of um, organising her affairs that she selected. It wasn't something that she had no choice over. And. Um, I, as an ordinary uh, super rich individual, that's you would expect that in this country because that's what we do for a living. We um, uh, we're a, a tax haven. Let's not pretend otherwise. That's what we do. We used to make things, and then um, a certain uh, individual. You, you remember uh, Margaret Thatcher? No! Yeah, that's her. A certain individual uh, made it such that um, we didn't make things anymore, and all we did was move numbers about on a screen to and from the Cayman Islands or uh, the British Virgin Islands or, you know, one of those other uh, dodgy tax havens with the Union Jack flying from their government building. That's what we do now. The Isle of Man. Places like that. Hendon. Hello, Elkin. Hi, Nick. Elkin. Uh, Yes. Uh, Basically, when I was uh, uh, looking at this uh, fiasco with Rishi Sunak's a wife's case. Uh, I was also trying to think of the other side of it. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, let me make it clear that I'm not a fan of the current government, nor in favor of uh, building as avoiding tax. But the thing is, the non-dom uh, status. Uh, I, I understand the it, this was brought in and legislated by the government for a reason. So, in 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 my understanding, I think this is basically to draw FDI, foreign direct investment, into the country. Uh, and probably for those people who can basically come and invest here, you know, to avoid double taxation for them. 
Okay, if not, nobody's going to come and invest here. Well, and then, fact, uh, why, why, does, uh, why do people invest in Germany or in America or in any other country in the world that doesn't uh, have t tens of thousands of pages in their tax code for uh, people uh, like him of his status to be able to skip around the rules while saying that they're obeying all the rules? Uh, well, in, in this case, uh, legally speaking, uh, I think his wife has been obeying the rules. Of course, they all do, legally yes, speaking, obey the right. rules. That's but, because but, but the rules were, were written that. with them in mind. Uh, okay, so was this non-dumb brought in by Rishi Sunak himself, or was this there for some time? It's been there for some time, but uh, and, the, and the reason, the justification that is given for uh, the super-rich to avoid paying their taxes is that we, the little people, should be uh, grateful for whatever they decide they will pay. I, and I just don't buy that at all. And you hear it so much. Oh, if we uh, tax them, uh, you know, like uh, the rest of us, then they'd all uh, up sticks and leave. Yeah, but they don't, though, do they? Almost none of them do. I mean, some of the, uh, the, 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 the most unattractive of them will go to, uh, you know, some, uh, some monoculture where a billionaire is just to sit around and oh God, God knows what they do in Monaco. I mean, what do you do in Monaco, for crying out loud, other than sip 15 pound cups of coffee? And that's the problem with attracting billionaires, is it does quite quickly make the place that they live unaffordable to everybody else. I mean, it's one of the reasons that the uh, housing market has gone stratospheric in London is because billionaires compete with each other to buy five million pound houses and ten million pound houses. And if they can't do that, then um, uh, yeah, funds from Malaysia and so on will come and buy an entire building and then rent them out. Which is why the higher up uh, one of these shiny new blocks of executive flatless you look, the less likely it is that the lights will be on because nobody lives there. All right, here's the bad news. Two companies linked to Chancellor Rishi Sunak's wife both took taxpayers' money to pay UK staff under the furlough scheme during the pandemic. What? Uh, the uh, Fish's wife, who is estimated to be worth uh, north of £700 million, has come under scrutiny for her tax-reducing non-domiciled status, as you know. But it's worse than that. She is apparently the fashion designer daughter of the billionaire who founded the software firm Infosys, which furloughed 3% of its UK staff in 2020. Now, keep in mind that the owner is a billionaire. The company was estimated by sources to have had up to 10,000 workers at the time, meaning up to 300 workers were furloughed. Now, a billionaire could just have continued to pay their wages. But why would you do that when we poor dopes who pay taxes can? 42-year-old Mrs. Murty also claimed up to £635,000 of furlough money at her gym business, Dig Me Fitness, when it closed its eight studios in London and Oxford. Is that true? She's worth 700 million quid, and she claimed £635,000 of furlough money, which her husband was doling out, by the way. Ms. Murty had a 4.5% stake in Digme Fitness and was a director of the firm, but it collapsed, leaving the taxpayer, that's you, with debts of £415,000. Figures revealed by the Daily Mirror in February 2021 showed that Digme Fitness had claimed between 50000 and a and 100000 in furlough money in December of 2020. But it's worse than that because a later report in the Times in March 2022 then revealed it had received between £310,000 and £635,000 in furlough between December 2020 and September 2021. She's worth £700 million or more. The chain, Digme Fitness, appointed administrators this February after struggling to relaunch itself online with live-streamed workouts and collapsed, owing around £6.1 million, amongst which £415,000 owed to you. Specifically, owed to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. 
which were said to be for unpaid VAT, PAYE and national insurance. That's uh, according to the Times. <sighs> well, you've got, you got to have a laugh, ain't you? <laughs> uh, Uxbridge, Raymond. Hello, Nick. Raymond. I just ran up to tell you some of the benefits of Brexit. For... Ah, good. Um, I was at a, a family occasion on Friday and I saw two nephews I haven't seen for a while. Mm. One's a bricklayer and the other's a carpenter. Yes. And they were telling me that their wages since Brexit have gone up from about 50000 a year to 70000 Now, that's a 40% increase. Right. Well, that's good for them. That's due to not having any cheap continental labour coming over here and underpricing their jobs. You could say the same for fruit pickers. Uh, the bad side, the downside of that is fruit's not getting picked. And uh, so I suppose with the example that you're giving, uh, Raymond, uh, walls, aren't getting, working. walls aren't getting built. Oh, yeah, but that's, that's got a benefit. No, well, no, it isn't. Not if you want a wall built. No, oh, well, but 70% of the population are householders. Yeah. And, and the lack of houses are getting built is driving prices up beautifully. So, <laughs> it's, well, that, that's a, a, as much of an I'm all right, Jack, statement as I've ever heard, Raymond. They're, they're rocketing up the house of prices, the price of houses beautifully. Well, that's an interesting well, take it on is. it. My house has gone up from approximately 70,000 two years ago. To over 80,000. Like um, I no, sorry, said, I'm I all right, them. Jack, says Raymond. Nice attitude there. Thanks a lot, Raymond. Vote Conservative. Oh, you were going to do that anyway. Uh, Knighton. Hello, Barry. Oh, Barry. Oh, Barry, yes, this yeah. is Barry speaking from, yes, Barry. Uh, from downtown Knighton. Knighton. In, Down mis in Mid Wales. Oh, sounds a delight. Yes, what it certainly is. Um, what it was until we had a wind farm put next door to us. Lovely. Yes, very lovely. Um, in fact, we can sit in our living room and see the blades going round. Great. And reflecting the sunlight mm -hmm. and the flashing and flickering. Flashing and the flickering. Well, that sounds it, excellent. Well, it is. It's like a it, party over at your place. Well, <clears throat> well, it is. The problem is, it's also like a party, very noisy. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the problem. We don't like it. We want to move. Unfortunately, nobody wants to buy our house. Well, that seems okay. Are, I'm, are I'm not suggesting. No, not really. I'm. I'm, <laughs> I'm not suggesting it's. It should. They should be built next to where people live. But if they put them down the corridors that are formed by motorways, nobody lives next to a motorway. No one. So yep. they could just build them down motorways. Problem solved. Well, that doesn't actually help me when I'm trying to sell my <coughs> home. No. I had three independent estate agents visit. Mm -hmm. They all independently came to the same conclusion. That. that this wind farm has devalued my property between 20 and 30 thousand pounds yeah no now, doubt who is going to pay me compensation i don't know barry but it it's... should be the welsh assembly government well it the should labor it, it welsh sh assembly government it should be whichever electricity company is benefiting from the juice that gets uh, sucked out of the air by those blades well i can tell you that the wind farm developer has sold the wind farm to an investment company yeah. for one hundred million pounds. A hundred million pounds. Now, why would they sell it to an investment company to make money? Of course. Of course. But where's my compensation? I don't know, Barry. You, you, it's like you're blaming me for it. It's got nothing to do with me. If people uh, put it uh, where uh, others are living to the detriment of those people, then that is clearly wrong and it shouldn't have happened. But there are no end of places in this country where nobody is living, where we can put to wind farms, where the, where the scenery is not an, uh, an area of outstanding natural beauty. We've got to stop pretending that every single inch of this country cannot uh, be um, ruined in any way, shape or form. It, can, it can't be built upon and it can't be... Um, it's, uh, it's, um, 
resources can't be taken. Of course they can, but they shouldn't put it next to where people live for crying out loud any more than they should put a nuclear power station at the bottom of your garden. I sympathise with you, Barry, but it's got nothing to do with me. I restate my case. Every motorway corridor in this country should have a, um, a, a an avenue of wind farms down it. Why not? I think they look particularly beautiful. I wouldn't want to live next to one, but then, um, you know, I wouldn't want to live next to um, uh, an aviary. <laughs> you know, because they make a racket and all. <laughs> Muswell Hill. Hello, Bill. Hi, Anik. Good evening. Nice to talk to you, sir. Bill. Well, I've got two points to make to the to your listeners. Number one, Vladimir Putin thinks he's back in the KGB years, which is not not true, really. Um, well, he never really we left. Technology. We have the technology to, to eliminate him if, if we want to. We do? Yep. Wow. A little, uh, a little um, drone and a face recognition <laughs> and finished. Right. As simple as that. As simple as that. The second one, the second one is uh, he is uh, elim eliminated, um, uh, kidding himself because he thinks he's the richest man on the planet as uh, i don't know if a lot of people know that yeah because all the olig oligarchs they have to pay him 10 percent of their profits 50. in different accounts 50 according to bill are... browder sorry F according to bill browder the uh, oligarch hunter it's 50 percent no 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 10 percent of the profits maybe 50 percent in, in different manner well we don't really know so let's not argue about it no neither i i don't know for fact i overheard it through through you know, read it uh, through the years. Yeah, any, anyway, by many accounts, he is the richest man in the world. He, even if he isn't, he's got no end of money. No, no. But basically, well, all of Russia's money himself? is his money. He can just access as much of, or li as little of it as he likes. Yeah, Nick, what I'm trying to say in simple English is that because he is kidding, kidding himself, because he thinks as soon as he destroys the country, he can rebuild it because you've got the money. I and don't think he... I don't, I'm not he sure has. he's interested in rebuilding it. I know, I mean, he will eventually, I mean, if he wins it, which, uh, let's hope you won't. Make, make sense to you? Uh, not really, no. Uh, <laughs> well, 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 maybe, well, maybe I'm I mean, just not um, paying an, uh, close enough attention, but no, I don't, uh, I don't get, I don't detect that he's interested in rebuilding the country. He seems to be doing um, an excellent job of dismantling it. But thanks, Bill. Merseyside, hello, Eileen. Hi, uh, Nick. Hi, Hi uh, I just wanted to pick up on two points that, um, that woman mentioned about wetting herself. I'm always wetting myself. Oh. I've got a rusted back. Yeah. And the other one, Jesus. Well, well I'm coming straight in about what I'm, I phoned up about regarding Jesus. And basically, you know, how can someone do a job with bad tools? Can they do a job with bad tools? I don't think so. So Chris is a dick being ousted because... There's no rules left. There's just bylaws and trilaws being set up to appease a load of foreigners coming in and a load of people that are up to no good. Because you can't say boo to a goose to them because they're 10 steps ahead of a mile ahead of the law. Eileen, 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 I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking Why? about? Well, listen, I'll explain it to you. Let me spell it out for you, Nick. <laughs> Let me spell it out for you like kindergarten <laughs> children do, eh? Yeah, please Nigga do. Wow. I think we better mark her with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Make absolutely sure. She doesn't get anywhere near on air again. I should have gone with my gut instinct. Whew. I'm sitting in, um, in a studio that I don't normally sit in. And so things are not where I expect them to be. And in an emergency, I'm looking for the dump button and I'm not finding it. <laughs> and so I just, uh, and, and you, your, your sort of vision goes a bit cloudy. You can't see anything anymore in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in the circumstance of a tremendous emergency. And I really couldn't find the button marked delay dump. 
but I think that I got there just in time. Phew. She was, uh, oh, I don't know. Would it be rude to say out of her mind? Uh, South End. Hello, Christine. Hello. Um, Christine. Hello. Good uh, evening. Um, they're talking about arresting after uh, all this Ukrainian war is going on, mm. arresting Putin for war crimes. Why don't they go and do it now? instead of waiting after the event when he's killed God knows how many people, he's bombed so many cities and left them devastated. Mm. What, why don't they go and do it now? What is the reason why they can't arrest him now? Well, if he steps foot time. if he steps foot outside Russia, then we might be able to do that, but <clears throat> not while he stays where he is. Really? Yeah, really. How would you get him? Well, they talk. The, you know, I listen to I listen to uh, you all day, right? Not you personally. <laughs> <laughs> LBC. Right. I listen to LBC, right? Yeah. And they're talking about uh, war crimes. Yes. They're going to arrest him. Well, why? Why can't they do it now? What he has to step outside. Well, yeah, if you're, what you're proposing is to invade Russia. That's what um, we're trying to avoid. Or well, that's what NATO are un unwilling to uh, actually countenance. Yeah, if, uh, if he presents himself in London, then, yeah, we might uh, have a chance at arresting him. I'd give it a go myself. Um, Westminster. John. Oh, hi, Nick. John. You're my favourite presenter. Thanks. Yeah, um, well, uh, you, you, you know what, you, you, are you talking about uh, economics and all that? Was I? Economics, economics. Economics? Yeah, about, about the government. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, you know what I think? I hesitate I think, to ask. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, that people, that people would turn around and say, no, nah, man, it's not worth, work. it's not, it's not worth going into work anymore. Who would turn around just, and say I that? I just claim benefits. Right, who would say that? The people that are being crippled by, by, by the government, with, 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 with the money, with, with the bills. Wow, it's, it's like um, E101, this show, isn't it? No. It's like an economics yeah. lesson in uh, like, happening right now. I hope that you're taking notes, people. Yeah, yeah. Did, have you noticed something? Have you noticed something, Nick? Well, I've, right? noticed, I've noticed Ever since... well, at least one thing. Go on. Ever since some Twin Towers collapse in New York, right, yeah? We've had all these problems, one problem after another. <laughs> I almost spewed coffee onto myself. One problem <laughs> after another, you say? Yes. Yeah, one, have you noticed? Have you noticed ever since 2001? No, I haven't We've noticed. But after another. No, I, I've, been, I've been mostly drunk since then. Booze. I haven't noticed a thing. Oh, well then. Well, I don't know then. I can't, I can't, answer, I can't answer your question. No, pair. you can't answer my question. I, but I didn't pose a question in the first place, so I think we are in perfect harmony. I didn't ask a question, and you can't answer it, even if I did. Excellent work there, John. Thanks for whatever that was. Bodmin. Hello, Malcolm. Oh, I'm okay there, mate. Yes, good, thanks. Nick, um, I'm, I'm listening to you, and I'm watching the, the press previews on BBC News and Sky. Oh, yeah. And they're showing the front pages, and there's not a mention of Richie Sunak anywhere. Really? It's all Boris. Oh, it's all God. Boris in Kiev. Do you think Boris went there to take um, the, the, the the spotlight off Richie Sunak? Any chance? Um, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure that uh, Bodger actually has Fishy Sunak's best interests at heart. If he's if he's doing a distraction uh, routine which I wouldn't doubt for a second, then it's to take our eye off his various travails. Yeah, I think you're right. But seriously, though, there's, there's barely a mention on the, in, in the papers of tomorrow of Richie Sunak's travails. Well, what, what other stories have they got? It's, it's all Kiev and, and Bodger. There must be some other Everywhere. stories, surely. No, well, that's it. Bo I mean, is it really know, Boris? Maybe... Boris Johnson saves the world, really. Boris Johnson with the chickens. Boris Johnson. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. 
<laughs> I must see that picture. I want to see a picture of no, Boris Johnson he, holding a chicken. He looked, receiving it, he looks quite startled. But yeah. then again, so does, so does Vladimir. Um, this lady walks up to them with these two mm. chickens and just hands them over. Yeah, well, Vladimir yeah. Zelensky must have been somewhat surprised when Bodger Johnson hoved into view. He must have thought, who's this tramp? <laughs> 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 did you did you see it? Well, the the video. If you watch the video, hmm. Boris gets a, a very long run up before he gets to um, Vladimir. He, he oh, walks yeah. about fifteen meters to get to him all on camera. Right. He sort so of, fair play. He's he's gone there. He was well received, and you know, I it's it. It's a positive thing, I think, his visit. Right, well, sure. OK, then. J just wait till Vladimir Zelensky finds out um, how much, uh, how many rubles Boris Johnson's got carrying in <laughs> in those uh, pockets in his jacket. I see the picture now. There he is with his um, with his chicken. It looks like he's broken it. Uh, Vladimir Zelensky, he's got a chicken, and Bodger Johnson's well, got a chicken. It looks like Bodger's broken his. Well, Boris asks the lady... Who presents them? What is it for? Is it for water or wine? Yeah. <laughs> and, and the lady, obviously, there was a bit of a language thing there. She didn't quite get it, but mm. she she picked them up somewhere in Poland, and it just happened to be on on the street, I think, and she presented them. Right. Well, if, very good. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I was um, a, a political leader and I was uh, out of the blue given <laughs> given something yeah. on on the streets <laughs> near Russia, I don't think I'd touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> You could have x rayed, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right, thanks a lot, Malcolm. Newcastle, hello, Stuart. Hey, Nick. Stuart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I You're was just following up, um, spoke to a guy there before you. Um, I think a lot of people sort of don't realise how important or influential the Queen could be going forward and how important the, the Commonwealth is. And, we, and I'd say probably 99% of the British population don't understand what the Commonwealth is. I think, I think it's a watered down version of the Olympics. <laughs> but it's actually, it's just 16 values and principles. And at the top would be like democracy, human rights, international peace and security. And the Queen champions herself on this. That's what she's, her legacy is. She's committed herself to the Commonwealth. And uh, she probably sits there for a great deal of time now thinking, I've got to meet up with all these other world leaders when my own parliament, just along the road, has just sold British steel to a communist, to the Chinese Communist Party. Where, you know, in number one of my values and principles that I champion with democracy, um, and and I think that's that, that's the problem we have. I think if the Queen could sort of hand pick a parliament, which she couldn't do, get dictatorship. But if she could, they would do a completely different job to what our government does. Well, it's a bit odd though, having a democracy with a, an a, an unelected head of state. That doesn't sound very democratic. It, it doesn't, but I think we've got to try and deal with the world they live in. Uh, the world we live in, not, not the world we'd, we'd love to have. It's just sort of, it is what it is. We're at the stage in humanity that, that we've got to. Um, and, you th and we think to ourselves, you know, the, the world once was kingdoms and, and kings and queens and there's still uh, the remains of it. But we look at what's happening with elected world leaders, apparently, and you've got one that's invaded the country and is, is sucking it to the ground. Well, you've got that, another one. I, I would dispute that he's an elected leader. I think he, he's just uh, dug his heels in and uh, insisted that he's that it's his country now. Yeah, well, he's, he's ring fenced his position, but not much not much different to what the, the Chinese president's done. Well, exactly. Um, and who's just sort of militarised his population over forty years yeah, but, and gone to war I, with I, us I, Yeah, but I, I don't think you're going to get very far if you compare the <laughs> the Queen as an unelected head of state to um, the the Chinese leader or Vladimir Putin. But it's just, it just is, it's a bit strange to say that uh, she's, um, you know, all, all about uh, democracy when she's in, when her position is just by accident of birth. Uh, Lester, hello, Adam. Hello, Nick. Good evening. Yes, Adam. Yes, uh, I think Joe Biden should have thought before he spoke. He's made a very quick speech, which doesn't make any sense. Do you remember... Uh, Afghanistan. Do you remember the existence of the um, Taliban? Taliban was created by United States of America in the same situation, in the same scenario. Mm. Well, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't create it. It, it sort no, of grew up on, as Nick, a consequence Nick, Nick, of, should, of things that were happening there. They didn't create we, the Taliban. We should not put a spin on some of these things. Look, war everywhere 
should be condemned. We don't want war. We want peace. And to have a peace, there should be uh, uh, equal justice before we can ha- attain some form of peace. What do you mean equal? Western, what do you mean equal justice? Justice. Yes, justice. I mean justice. Well, what do you mean? Killing, justice for whom? Yeah, for whom? Justice for humanity. Well, that's Killing a that's a tall order. We we have to have justice for humanity before we do yes. anything to stop war. Yes, yes. We can't should. we can't we try to stop war first and deal with justice for all of humanity second? We have to stop war, but to stop war, we should be honest. A war in Iraq is a war. Killing an Iraqi is killing, which we should condemn. Killing Lithuanian, we should condemn. Killing Ukrainian, we should condemn. Killing Russian, we should condemn. Mm. We should not agitate for a regime change. We've had enough of it. Tony Blair should have been in the Hague. We should not. We should not agitate for. So, so you're you're okay with Vladimir Putin threatening the entire planet with its destruction? What has has he threatened the entire planet of a destruction? How? Well, because he's threatened us with nuclear weapons. Vladimir Putin Since is when, threatening when, six billion when, people. Every single living thing on Earth has been threatened by that man who is um, he's got his finger poised over the nuclear button. And are we to just to sit here? Six billion people, every piece of flora and fauna on the planet is at his disposal. But we must um, just accept whatever his decision is in that regard, because to question him would be rude. Are you kidding me? Let's have a call in um, Merthyr Tidfil. Keith. Mr. Nick Abbott, can Keith. you hear me? Yes, Keith. Loud and clear. Clear as a bell. Go ahead. That makes a change. There's not many people hear me that way. I Well you do a sound a bit of... you do sound a bit muffled, come to think of it. Okay, great. But can you hear me now? <laughs> well, don't take it so personally. Go ahead. Right. I'm a product of when the last time they decided to run the experiment on changing the clocks. Yeah. I was a small kid. I was given a bright orange overcoat to wear when I went to school because it was still dark. Right. The result of that experiment was children who died. Yeah, Keith, Keith, it's either going to be dark, it's either going to be dark in the morning or dark in the evening. Children don't stay in school overnight. They've got to come home at at some point in the day. Yes, they're going to come home. And if they're going to come at three o'clock or four o'clock with the clocks changed either way, they will be coming home in daylight. In dark. Do not treat me like a small kid. They're not going to be coming home. Of course they will. What time does it get dark in the wintertime? What time will we get dark in the winter? Front? Yes. I'll tell you. Get hold of Google. Look it up yourself. Well, that's not you. That's not you telling me. That's the opposite of you telling me. That's you not telling me. God, calm down, mate. It's just a radio show. Crying out loud, Mirtha Tidfield. What's in the water down there? Painful. <laughs> <laughs> where did that last bloke come from? I mean, apart from Merthyr Tidfil, you know, where sort of, uh, like, spatially, mentally, where, where, where did he come from? But I bet you look great in a, in a luminous orange vest, though, Keith. God, you must have looked absolutely marvellous. A right picture, I bet. Oh, he's called back. Only one call per show, Keith. Thanks for your uh, input. Appreciate it. Thank you. You've delighted us enough. Howard texts, Cornwall, answer the call and see if he's still angry. (laughs) I'm just talking about light, that's all. Howard texts, Cornwall, besides which, kids don't walk to school these days. What decade are you living in? Their mothers drive them in a car the size of a tank. And then they park on the pavement. Oh, update. Keith is angry. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's very uh, concerning, Keith. Please give us an update when your mood changes. I am interested in what you think. Uh, Lewisham. Hello, Jane. Hello. Nick. Jane. Yes, Jane. I voted for Nigel Farage. What do you want to do that for? 
Well, if he was running the country, it mm -hmm. wouldn't be like this no, you, at all. No, you can say that again. We've got a few idiots in our party. Yes. <laughs> Shut up. Nick, mm -hmm. do you think that Nigel knows of the motoring party co uk? The motoring party? .co.uk um, He could help the motoring party .co.uk .co .uk. Yes Yeah. Who are they and, then? Um, yeah, he would Who, he who would are be, they? Who are they? Look them up the I'm not, I, I will party. not do anything of the sort Tell me who they are Why not? Because that's homework I don't do homework at the weekend But miss, it's the weekend We'll do that on Monday, then. Uh, uh, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll pencil it in on Monday. Excellent to work there, Jane. Thanks a lot for, you know, whatever that was. Now I've got Nigel's page up. I could uh, play the, um, you know, the, the clip. Do you want to hear the clip? Oh, OK, then. I, I, I'm uh, immensely um, grateful to you for everything you've done in British politics over the last few years. Uh, I used to be a an ardent Remain. I voted Remain. I believed in the European project. Mm hmm uh, I believed that staying in the European Union was the best thing for us. And then something happened and something monumental happened. I, it completely changed my, my opinion on, on the, the whole situation. What, uh, what was that monumental thing, Mark? I, I was kicked in the head by a horse. <laughs> right, very good. <laughs> OK, fine. Thank you. No, thank you, Nige. You're the best. <laughs> How did you get taken like that? We are thick. We are stupid. OK, then. Everything about that clip is perfect. The The guy's timing, whoever he is, he should be a paid professional, a comic professional. Uh, Lester. Hello, Stanley. Hi, Nick. Um, thank you for taking my call. So what I just have to suggest is that um, um, politicians have to be brave to open up the discussion and debate. There are patient groups all over the country and um, people have to come to understand that um, the NHS in this current form is not sustainable and um, particularly giving. So the my suggestion is that um, things like emergency services and cancer services, which obviously if you don't do anything about it, people could lose their lives. Those things should remain free. But if people could pay, um, you know, loads of cash for their monthly bills, electricity, you know, water, car bills and all that. I think um, it's time to introduce a system whereby people will be paying something, for example, hip replacements and um, some surgeries that could wait. I mean, I don't see any harm opening it up to patient groups to tell them that if, if, if you could pay in something every month towards um, your, your health insurance, and you need a hip replacement, you could have it the next day instead of waiting for 24 months. But, but, so I but think Stanley, people do pay something in every day. It's called tax. But I mean, it's not, it's not free. We don't, we don't magic it out of nowhere. People are already paying a vast amount, something of the order of 100 and, is it 130 billion pounds a year. It's not free. It might appear as though it's free because we don't get a bill at the point of use. But it's massively expensive. So, it, it, and it doesn't seem as though that money is actually going, um, is, is being spent in the best possible way compared to our nearest competitors over the water there. Uh, Hammersmith, hello, Matt. Matt. Hello. Yes, Matt. It's Matt. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I just want, Nick, I just wanted to talk to you about vitamin pills. Is Matt there? It's Matt. Ha hello. <laughs> hello. Can you hear me? Hello. hello. Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, Matt. Hi, Nick. It's Matt. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the vitamin pills you're mentioning. Right. You said they didn't do anything. Correct. I'm taking 20, day, uh, 20 pills a day, minimum, in the morning. Um, I, I, personally, I think it's, um, it's the way forward for a healthy lifestyle. Is it? Well, thanks for passing that information on there, Matt. Excellent work. I just, uh, I've just got a feeling, you know, and I'm going to go with my gut instincts. <laughs> I think I made the right choice there. Affirmative. Thanks a lot, Matt. Good work. You've delighted us enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm on about, like, 20 or 30 pills a day now, man. I just rattle when I walk, that's all. Chelsea. Hello, Mark. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. 
uh, when uh, Putin, I'm sorry to go back to this boring old news of Ukraine and Putin. Rutin Tutin. Um, he, he said, his words were, Britain, I quote, Britain will pay a high price for this, meaning um, we're now approaching, we've exceeded a billion in cash and state-of-the-art weaponry along with the U.S. Mm. Uh, one of your experts uh, kindly referred, it, referred to it as the Anglosphere. Uh, so I hesitate to call it the North Atlantic Treaty Organization because it's not Turkey, Greece, Portugal, and various other countries. It seems to be um, America and Britain who lead the way as they do God's own work in theater after theater after theater. What, what, are, what Mark, what are you talking about? God's own work? I am talking work. about... What's, okay. God, what's God got to do Got to do with it? Okay, put him out of the equation, or her out of the equation. Yes. Now, given the historical undeniable fact that you as a journalist know... I'm not a journalist. Che okay, you're a carpenter. Listen to me. Czechoslovakian Semtex via Libya made its way to the IRA. If we... Oh, God, Mark, are... what are you talking about? I mean, seriously. Does this have anything to do with what we have been talking about for the last two and a half hours on this show? You won't let me tell you what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, something up, head, headline it for me in five words. Right. We equip people to shoot at his troops. It is very possible the new IRA and the real IRA will be re-equipped and refunded. Is that what you're worried about, the IRA? If the IRA want to um, equip and uh, equip themselves with uh, military hardware, I'm sure it's relatively easy for the IRA to get. Ain't got no uh, never mind about what we do in uh, Ukraine. Are you saying that the U what, our reaction to what's happening in Ukraine is a good or a bad thing? I'm not sure. Sorry, what was the question? Oh, well, I refer you to the question I gave some moments ago. This, this entire show will be out on a podcast shortly. You'll be able to uh, listen to it again. I don't know where that was going, uh, Mark, but I knew that uh, I didn't want to go there. That was a destination I did not pay a ticket to, to travel to. But at least he was angry. <laughs> it was something about Semtex. Um, I think that's a new delivery company, isn't it? I think they changed their name from, um, from one thing to... And now they're called Semtex. Hillingdon. Hello, Hamid. Uh, hello, Nick. How are you doing? You right? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me in your show. Um, so, in regards to the uh, Biden's uh, statement about the uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, I believe that it, that is very uh, pr uh, provocative and, and very uh, uh, harsh statement in regards to di diplomacy. Diplomacy. Uh, yes, if 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 we want to, you know, end the war, we had to we have to be positive going forward. Uh, and end the war there. Well, that's uh, to me, that sounded like a pretty positive thing to think that to Vladimir Putin would be removed from power one way or the other. That is correct, yes. And uh, so, uh, if, uh, okay, Mr. Putin has made the mistake of, you know, um, uh, taking his troops into Ukraine. It's by a mistake. Force and, uh, Yes, I mean, he's he, he done a mistake and he has, he now he has realized it and then he's going and he's trying to, you know, go, go back and, you know, correct the mistake. Well, I don't think there's any evidence that he's going back. Is there? I don't, uh, I'm not, not sure yet. that he thinks he's made a mistake. I think he thinks uh, he's done the right thing. It's just that the way in which his generals have carried out his orders, that's a mistake. That is, that's right, yes. So, so uh, that's why in order to have a diplomacy, so uh, they have to sit and, uh, you know, end the, end the war there. Well, and the only, the only, I, the I only way diplomacy can work is if both sides are serious about it, but there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that Vladimir Putin is remotely interested in diplomacy. I mean, his, his uh, history is to sit around a table after um, trying to annihilate a people and pretending to talk, pretending to be interested, while rearming his troops for another attack. That, that is quite correct. I mean, what whatever he's done is, is you know, unbelievable and, and unthinkable to human race because by by going forth into, into a country and massacring innocent people is just not not correct. I mean, that, the same the same scenario happened in Afghanistan, where the the Soviet Union troops um, invaded Afghanistan by force and they 
you know, my, my parents have stories that they, you know, they wouldn't even uh, let the animals to, to live. So they used to um, come by jets and then uh, drop the bombs there. So, and the people resisted there and the people really resisted and, uh, you know, defeated there uh, at that point and then they, 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 they went back. So the, the point is that obviously the people will, will resist. If the Russia will stay there, the people will be obviously quite uh, resistful. So, so the, Putin has understood that mistake and uh, he's trying to now negotiate. So for but, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm not sure that he is, though. Well, what evidence is there that he's trying to negotiate? <laughs> Uh, I, it would be good if uh, if he if he could or if he would rather, but um, I don't see any suggestion that that's actually the case yet, or will <clears throat> or will ever be. See, the problem that he has is that if he loses this, he probably loses his control over the country, and if he loses his control over the country, then he will over the oligarchs, which are the people that are keeping his money. There is no big bank account with Vladimir Putin written on it. He, he doesn't sign a check with his own names written on it. He has people holding his money. And if he's not the leader anymore, then they, they might not return his calls. That's his problem. All right, thanks a lot, Hamid. It's, it's, it's actually all about money, this. One man's greed is threatening the livelihood of six billion people. And Joe Biden is being rude, he's being undiplomatic to say that it might be a good idea if he didn't lead the, a country anymore, if he didn't threaten to blow up the world. <laughs> I, I don't recognise this planet anymore. Looking ahead, Margaret says, it was Labour who cancelled nuclear power. Margaret and stop being so envious of Boris. Margaret and stop being so envious of Boris. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> It was Labour who cancelled nuclear power, Margaret, and stopped being so envious of Boris. OK, it doesn't make any sense, but it fits right in, oddly. But first, here is an important call I must take in Bromley. Hello, Neil. Hello, mate. Yeah. I'd just like to say about um, Labour, despite um, all, all, all of the, uh, the brilliant policies and whatever that you, that you, you bring up, um, they they are spectac spectacularly and have been unelectable simply because they don't have anyone at the front. Because ultimately, people vote for people, and they don't seem to be able to have anyone apart from Blair, who was the most uh, conservative-like Labour leader that I've ever seen, mm. um, that can actually get on with have a rapport, build up a rapport on, with the media, and build up a rapport as far as. Uh, in conferences and such like. Yeah. Um, there's many examples. A couple spring to mind, like Neil Kinnick and Jeremy Corbyn. But th th these people are, regardless of what the Tories do, um, they, they seem to be, they, they just fail to win despite of, you know, in spite of themselves. Mm. You know? I, yeah, I agree, kind of. But really, is that what we want in this country? We want some, We want to be entertained? No, no, I'm not saying that it's what we want. I'm just saying that that's what that that's the way it is. Yeah. I mean, people vote for people, and if, if uh, when Neil Neil Kinnock should have uh, at that particular point, I mean, he, he was just he made so many gaps, so many mistakes, and obviously the, it's the appearance of people. People, if you look like a, like Jeremy Corbyn, for example, who always reminded me of a geography teacher who you know, didn't wash very often. Mm. Well, as, a, as opposed look, to our current dear leader. No, no, I mean, there, we have had some slick leaders, and the Conservatives have had some slick ones, but this one particularly is not, is not a case in point. But if you look at Boris, if, if his dream was to be the king of the world, or, um, or wherever it was supposed to have been, and he's been waiting for this moment, it's obviously been a poison chalice for him, because I, can you imagine what he would have thought when he's going to be Prime Minister, what he, what he imagined it would be like? Neil, I, th I, think, I think the temptation is to think just that that it was, uh, that he's not having the, the time of his life. I bet he absolutely is. There can't possibly well, have know. been... A, yeah, there can't have been a better time to siphon off money from the public purse mm. and put it into the pockets of friends and donors <laughs> than a pandemic. Yeah. The only thing that would be better would be a war. Right. I mean, it's all very well. You, you see Labour uh, on, on the TV. They, they're always sniping from the sidelines. But if you're having to deal with a worldwide epidemic, pandemic, 
and you're having to deal with something that's unprecedented and not, you know, there's no way that you could plan for it. Also well, no, that's not true. Got... There's ab- that's well, absolutely yeah. not true. About that's six months before it started, the government's yes. own body said that we right. need uh, a lot of PPE because there might be a pandemic coming down the line. Right. Six months later, there was, and the government had done absolutely nothing about it, so they didn't have any. OK, so you're, la- you're, you're laying the... Um... The mortality rate of COVID on, on the Conservative government for not for not doing anything about it because they had prior information, yeah? No, they didn't have prior information. They were told that we were not up to the task of handling a pandemic should there be one. And six months right. later, there was one, and they hadn't mm-hmm. done anything about it. Right, OK. I mean, I, I think it's very hard to, to predict something that's going to happen. I mean, if, if, No, if you're, case, you're like, not listening to what I'm saying. They didn't pr- yeah. have to predict it. You don't have to predict something in order to yeah. plan for its eventuality. Uh, well, yeah, but uh, well, in, that, in that scenario, where do you stop? I mean, you, well, could, you, you, could you okay. Well, so you you need never actually build a hospital or hire another nurse because you don't know for sure that there are going to be sick people in the future. Of course, you do. There's bound to be, there's bound to be some problem in the future. That's what governments are for, to plan ahead, for the benefit of the people, not to just stumble around and wait until something's happening and then react accordingly, or just stand there with your mouth open looking stunned. They knew that they weren't up to the task of protecting this country. They were told by their own bodies, their own uh, health bodies said that about six months before the pandemic. They said, There's, uh, we, ha- we have a serious problem here. We, if something bad happens, we are not ready. And the government's reaction was to do nothing. So, yeah, of course it's their fault. And this um, unprecedented thing, as though, as though COVID only happened in this country. There's other countries most of whom did better than we did. Joining us to discuss this now is Dr. Chris Parry. Dr. Chris Parry is a former Royal Navy Rear Admiral, a former NATO commander, and a former Director General of the Ministry of Defence. Thank you very much for joining us, Chris. Hello, Nick. Uh, Well, let me ask you um, about that question first. Was this a little more than a publicity stunt? Well, I'm probably not the one to ask. I think President Zelensky is the one to ask. He he clearly appreciated it. Uh, It's given him a lot of uh, support. It's given him a lot of political credibility. And uh, he seemed to like it. And I think that justifies it alone, to tell you the truth. Yes, he um, was fulsome in his praise. Do you think that there was uh, an element of actually um, tweaking the conscience of not just Boris Johnson, but the West in general, by perhaps over-praising them for what relatively little they've done so far in order to uh, chivvy them up to do some more? Yeah, that's not normally his, been his style. He, he's quite forthright when he wants to criticise people. He's had a real go at Germany uh, recently and France. So I think uh, if he wanted to do that, um, he, he would have said so up front. He didn't, he didn't actually go as far as to say, look, here's Boris Johnson. He's done great things for us, so has the United Kingdom, but you other guys haven't. He, he was p- quite, quite careful to say, look, really glad Boris is here. The UK is our foremost a supporter after the United States. Now, yeah, that's saying something. And to tell you the truth, we are. We were politically and militarily first out of the traps in saying that, you know, this Russian invasion is both illegal um, and, and indeed must be stopped. Well, yep, saying something and actually doing uh, what, uh, you know, and, and acting in accordance to what you're saying is not necessarily the, the same thing. I mean, some people might think that we've been uh, dragging our feet on... Uh, uh, sanctioning uh, oligarchs specifically because that's where the Conservative Party was getting much of its money. But let's let's not go down that route. <laughs> let's, not, no. Let, let's talk about your field of expertise, which is defence. I've been sort of running through the possibilities in my mind that uh, Putin might, um, you know, set off a nuclear warhead at sea near uh, Finland or uh, Sweden or uh, Ukraine, and and then what would we do? Well, it's very interesting because uh, I don't even remember that when. Um North Korea got out of its box and President Trump faced them down. That's exactly what Kim Jong-un said. He said, no, perhaps I'll throw one into the sea and and see what happens. Um, And Trump said, fine, that's okay. But just remember, you know, we're a thousand times more powerful than you on the nuclear side. Do it if you want. And of course he backed down. I think he said Um, that I've got my button is bigger than your button. (laughs) 
don't know. I don't know. But, but the fact of life is Kim Jong-un got the message. Um, and, and the trouble is, once you get the nuclear genie out of the box, you can't actually determine what will come back the other way. Um, I mean, somebody said quite rightly, if you try and use a small nuclear weapon in a regional conflict like Ukraine, you can't be sure you're not going to get a whole boatload of tried back the other way. So people are very careful about unlocking that particular box. Uh, just finally, uh, NATO has said that they're going to um, reinforce their presence in the Baltic states to, um, it was a sort of a, a, a cursory presence at the moment along the border with uh, Russia. Um, what do you make of that? That's just going to annoy Putin more, isn't it? Yeah, I think we need to annoy him a bit more to tell you the truth. So one of the things I recommended at the start of this conflict is that we should actually pressure him where he is weak uh, rather than where he is strong. And I think we're starting to do that now. You know, we should put our nuclear submarines up into the Barents Sea to pressurise his northern fleet. We should be stepping on his toes around the Baltics and things like that. Uh, we, t we tend to think the Russians are 10 feet tall. We've seen that they aren't. Uh, and I think we need to keep up the pressure on Putin on every front right now. This is a seriously dangerous regime uh, and they need to be faced down. Chris, thanks so much for your time. Um, maybe this one. Let's see if I can squeeze this one in. Glasgow. Hello, Eric. Yeah, hello there, Nick. Eric. Yes, yes, morning, morning. The, um, there was a call on, uh, 10, 20 minutes ago about, um, the immigration status of the, the problems that, um, are, that, that, that's, that's been on with the, the immigrants and that what's happened with the P&O, um, ferries is quite, uh, a lot to do, I think, with, with the immigrants. The truth of this, the matter is, Nick, that in Glasgow, certainly, we have people in Glasgow that don't have any national insurance numbers um, and they've been living in Glasgow here for quite a long time. These people are, some of them are getting employed um, by by businesses um, and and they're getting, <laughs> they're getting filtered through the system. The, the truth of the matter is that there's a lot of immigrants coming from the Ukraine and our, our country is getting... getting if if um, you say full, I'll disappear you immediately. I would, I would say it's, 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 it's overflowing with people. I, that sounds and, like full to me. <laughs> well, you know, I, sh I should have gone with my gut instinct. There was just something about the uh, look of that call. Even before I took it, I knew it was a, a big mistake, huge. And I apologize. I am very sorry that I screwed up. Totally screwed. I mean, I am so sorry. You just don't know how sorry I am. I'm sorry. Streatham. John. Hello, Nick. An how ecstasy of fumbling. Yes, John. How are you? I am great, mate. How are you? Um, could be better. Could I, be better. I, I bought, well, that's very I disappointing bought, to hear. What's the problem? I bought two bags of shopping and it was £35. How much? 35 at, at one of the big shops. Oh, yeah. So what did you get? Oh, my God, I had some cake. I buy a smoothie. I don't know if I can mention the brand name, but it was very no. nutritious. And, no. And it was, um, it's not one of your advertised brands, and it was £3.70 a bottle. How much? Juice. <laughs> three pound seventy for a bottle of juice a juice yeah you don't want to uh, drink a juice you want to eat the vegetables or fruit that go into making the juice better but even that a banana was 40 pence which i was told by a homeless man is quite cheap a banana but... is not 40 pence no it was a, no, a, a no, no, no 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 a banana is no. about 10p no no okay yes, I was wrong. yes. 37p 37p a banana does not cost 37p, John. It I've just. I've got the picture and the I receipt. I'm don't not kidding. care. It just doesn't. What kind of a banana costs 37p? Can I say the shop I bought it from? No. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't mean to be. Um, rude, like, but. Rude. <laughs> right. With this whole economy thing, um, our American friends are very innovative people. Our, um, our American friends are very innovative people. But, well, that's because they're uh, mostly smart. Trust me, I'm like a smart person. Yeah. All right. Now, the point is, I think Rishi Sunak is a moron. 
and um, I think this entire conservative front bench, they make me sick. Right. But mm-hmm. the opposition are also just, they remind me of the people I grew up who are all sort of fat and on benefits, and there's nothing that... Keir Starmer me. looks like he's fat and on benefits to you. No, I was going to say, with the, I mean, he, he's getting a bit chubby, with the exception of Keir Starmer. They're all just moany, so especially... Um, Angela Rayner, Lisa Nandy. It's just, it reminds me of the people, and I don't want to rub you up the wrong way, but it reminds me of the people back in the day who were the Labour Party. And this is they, Nick Ferrari. They made this are point. the Labour Party. Yeah, Nick Ferrari made this point well, that they just used to throw benefits at sort of fatties who didn't want to go to union stuff. And the problem is, if we've got sociopaths on one side, on the Tory bench, and then we've got this sort of lefty nee on the Labour bench, there's, there's no one to vote for. And um, I'm just, I'm thinking, what, you know, where's the entrepreneurial spirit? Would you be up for discussing this with your co-host, who you have always a very smooth handover with, despite what you say about the brother, Rachel Johnson? Would I be willing to discuss it with Rachel Johnson? On a podcast, because you're both... Oh, God, no. Of... <laughs> right, OK. But Mate, I do three problem, podcasts then. already. and my, I'm yes. up to my eyeballs in podcasts. But you're always both very civil to one another at the handover, even though you call her brother like a fat moron and stuff. Well, I don't believe I've ever called him a, a fat moron. <laughs> you, say bad, you say bad things about it. But, but the, the, the point is that we've just got a moribund political system. We've got the, we've got the Labour Party who were, um, you know, when Blair was in power, they were, he was hugging Putin. And even in, in Cherie Blair's surprisingly good autobiography, she writes about the state of visit where Mrs. Putin was buying thousands of pounds worth of underpants with 50 pound notes. Um, and the Labour Party also ingratiate themselves to the Russians and then the Tory party are corrupt. And now we've got the, as Nick Ferrari says, the virtue signalling lefties who say, eh, it's a so. And I just, I don't think it's, I mean, I'm not a Tory voter. I did vote Tory because... So you, you, don't, many... <clears throat> you don't think that after 12 years of Conservative rule that the things that are wrong with this country have anything to do with the Conservative Party? No, I think they're completely. No, I think they're completely the Tories' fault, and I would, I would prefer this centre-left party than Corbyn, who I just thought was a lefty traitor. He wanted to get rid of nukes, like you did, and he would have just, you know, t- taken it from the, you know, communists and um, all of the sort of, you know, armed, armed rebel factions uh, in in. Oh you know, God, sort of John! Syria. What on so, earth are you talking about? Seriously, yeah, it's so, like spaghetti mind here. You just. Is there a point? Let's just yeah, let's no, just fast point, forward to the point, shall we? The point is that I think with that, with no disrespect, I think hard lefties like you and Corbyn who are saying. Okay, yeah, first of all, John, should, I'm not a hard lefty. You are uh, naive, is the point, and I think we would have been better with a Starmer type person. What are you talking about? In years. in what way am I a hard lefty? Oh, because you said that we should get rid of our nukes. That means we would have been being invaded. That's what Nick Ferrari. You, you think that we said. would have been invaded? Oh, you, you would have got rid of the nukes, would you? And then we would have come, oh, we like you crazy. Okay, John, mm-hmm. seriously, you, you make an argument like a child. What's with the voice? And you don't have to say that Nick Ferrari said that, and then you uh, give an explanation as to what it is that you think, as though you can uh, hide behind Nick Ferrari. Painful. Hard lefty. If we'd given up our nukes, we would have been invaded. What, like Belgium, you mean? Or Switzerland? Like that? Germany? You're an idiot, John, and I mean that in a helpful way. Stephanie says, 37 pence for one banana. Does that listener shop at Fortnum & Mason? Today I bought a bunch of five bananas from a well-known supermarket for a pound. Well, even that sounds a bit uh, high. Bananas are about... You can get a banana for 10p. That last bloke was an idiot. He he sounded like an idiot and he spoke like an idiot and his uh, arguments uh, were uh, idiotic. Therefore, an idiot! But I'm glad that he called. Uh, Tinmouth. Hello, David. 
Well, yeah, good morning to you. Yeah, I don't agree with the chap who's just stayed on, but that's another matter. I was very fortunate to meet the Queen and spent about three or four minutes just chatting to her at uh, what is now Bournemouth University. It was an amazing how quickly she put you at your ease. And, uh, well, it's what she does for a living. I mean, it's, you know, she's well, just, just being nice. Uh, yeah, but the people nice. that don't manage to get it done, and it is remarkable because it, it when when you first meet her, uh, I, I'm a fairly gabby sort of a bloke, but it, it struck me, I was struck dumb. But uh, within a minute or so, we were chatting, and she, it was it was an experimental kitchen at what is now Bournemouth University, and uh, in there were, were tasting booze, and she, she said, can I go and have a look what's in there? I, I said, well, of course, whatever you like. And she went in and put her heads inside these little cupboards, and kids were doing experiments on the effect of light on food, etc. And the, all the kids did a, a double take, and then she got to the far end one, where there was this beautiful Chinese girl, Do, was in there, and the Queen did a double take and spent a minute talking to her, and she came trotting back up, and we were talking, and she said, I must go and see that little Chinese girl, and down she went, and was chatting to her. Twenty years later, when I retired, uh, Do was at my retirement do, and the first thing she said was, wasn't that a day when the Queen came? And that was an effect, she had, the effect on everybody within that building was remarkable. Well, it's, it's understandable, uh, David, because the very next day she did the exact same thing, and the next day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, and probably uh, in the morning, and in the afternoon, and in the early evening. You know, chatting to people, is, uh, is, that's the job. But um, it's not the first time I've heard that, but I have also heard the opposite, that um, uh, I have a personal, not that didn't happen to me, but it happened to a, a friend of mine's mother who was, oh, I don't know whether I should even bother telling you, but anyway, the, the opposite is also true, that uh, she can not put people at their ease, just depending, you know, she's a human being, depends what mood you're in, I suppose. Uh, Liverpool, hello, Paul. Hi. Paul. Yes, I'd just like to sort of the uh, P&Os where the 800 staff are sacked. Um, I was just wondering, why doesn't the government do a compulsory purchase on the business and take over it and run it f f from the government instead of letting these privatised companies use it? Uh, well, I don't know. Because it's, uh, th this, this government is not really into privatisation. It's more into selling stuff. It's more like a smash and grab raid than a government. Yeah, they understand that, but they're still going to help the people. The 800 people are away. So if this happens where the ships are taken over, cheaper labour, it'll spread to other bigger companies. Well, I think that's that's more uh, the plan than an error. What do you mean a plan? Well, I think that if I had to choose between the Conservative Party deciding to break things up and sell things off and, and make it easier for corporations to fire people and rehire them on worse contracts, um, uh, or helping those very same people out uh, by, uh, you know, protecting their rights, then I would yeah. go with the former. I think that the Conservative Party is, is, yeah. more, is more like... That, that's what they mean when they say oh, we're going to get rid of all that red tape. It's the red tape that's protecting us that they're getting rid of. They're not doing us a favour, but they're, they're selling it to us as though they are. I mean, that's the thing that's holding you down. All of this red tape, we'll just get rid of that. And people say, yeah, great not understanding that it's only the red tape that is keeping them safe and in employment and uh, having, uh, you know, d decent to contracts and, and a, a fair wage. Yeah, I wouldn't hold your breath there, Rapport. Narbeth, Jimmy. Hiya, mate. Jimmy. Hiya. Wow, it's all slowed down since you came, <laughs> came on. <Yeah. laughs> Are you all right, Jimmy? Yeah, not too bad, mate. Great. What's up? Uh, he was talking about Kate and William earlier. Yeah. Wills and what's it? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, Wills and uh, uh, what? Whatever the what's name it? is, Kate yeah, and whatever it is. Yeah. And um, uh, the bits and pieces. I, I, thought, saw, you were, I thought you were, I thought you were uh, dying just for a moment. That was going to ring the ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got the impression that they're somewhat trying to fight the rearguard action. How do you mean? They know the monarchy is it stays a numbered. 
I think that they were just going through the motions. It looked to me now. I didn't actually see the moving images. All I saw were the pictures, and it looked like they were dead behind the eyes to me. Like they didn't want to be doing this. They were, they were, they, their toes were <coughs> curling. It's catching, Jimmy. Now you, you got me like I'm like I'm being strangled. Wait a minute. Well, it looked like they were dying behind their eyes to me, like, like just go, Let's so go back a bit in history to the Go back, way back, back monitor. into time, yes. Do you hear me? What? Can we go back and talk about the restoration of the monarchy? The restoration of the monarchy? After Cromwell. Oh, God, no. History, history lesson. Glory! Oh, please, well, no. Uh, whether it's uh, true history or... It's been uh, subverted, we, we don't know. But, I mean, when the monarchy was offered to people, they, there had to be terms and conditions. Yeah, always read the terms and conditions. Yeah. And um, the monarchy, while... Uh, well, 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 trying to make the country feel good and safe and... Uh, the, the monarchy are trying to make the country birthday. feel good and safe. Yeah. Are they? Uh, no, not now. Not now. No, of course not. Not now. Not now. The, 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 the people in charge, the the mandarins. I mean, um, <laughs> you know, they, 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 they used example. to be they used to be a, a mandarin in charge of America. Oh, shut up! But that's another matter entirely. Yeah, of course it is. But um, the Queen is very blameless because she's been indoctrinated from childhood as to what her duties are. Uh, but if we look back at recent history, the, um, the suffrage jets and the minor strike and hills. All of those things are uh, historical uh, moments, yeah. And that the is bean true. field. Mm. What do you know about the bean field? The bean next? field, oh, they grew... Um beans yeah and um uh, british it's my beans. second favorite field by the way the bean field uh stonehenge you know when the, the travelers were heading for there and, yeah um, stonehenge it was yeah. um oh 1982 the stonehenge festival went there straight out straight after glastonbury Ruby. it was That's like right. um it was like walking into mad max it was it was berserk there i've i've never seen anything like it before or since the gla the well, uh, stonehenge the festival man. right after glastonbury Yowza. 1982 yeah. what a year were you there, Jimmy? Because if so, that would explain a lot. Um, I'd better qualify myself here now. Uh, I've met uh, plenty of good and honest policemen, but the <laughs> institution is rotten to the core. Jimmy, you're all over the place. We need an A to Z to figure out where this conversation is going. Well, you, you can go anywhere you want. Anywhere you charge. want. Right. How about um, uh, screeching to a halt? How about what? <laughs> How about we bail out? How about um, we just leap overboard of this conversation and just uh, hope for the best? Are okay, you with me? do that then. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. This is very cooperative. Very cooperative person. Thank you. Does anything on this show make sense so far? No. <laughs> Merthyr Tidfil. Hi, James. Yeah, hi, Nick. Nick, I, I'd just like to say, look, I agree with you totally. Um, outside by me, we've got um, three lovely wind farms. Uh, oh, yes. and, uh, as, as you quite rightly said, they, they look beautiful. They do. And all they do is contribute to, to the grid. That's right. And When it's windy. When it's windy. And when it's not windy, they, they still look good, not moving. Yeah, but, but being in Wales and on top of a mountain neck, they, they're doing the job. Right. Right, and also, with, with the water, thankfully, we own our water here. It, it's a, it's a, it's a non-for-profit in, in Wales. Right. So um, we, we're doing all right on the environmental part. But I, I rang up to tell you, researcher, um, I can't vote for the Labour Party. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not a Tory, but, but I can't vote for them. Right. We're at dis we're at you don't have to apologise to me. I'm not telling <laughs> you to <laughs> vote Labour. I, I know, but we're at total opposite ends, Nick. You, you, you're, you're fully supportive of being in the European Union. Uh, I'm not. Um, I, I, I can't vote for them 
How, but, though, but yeah, but I, I Labour can't. aren't Labour aren't uh, saying that they're going to take us back into the European Union. But how how is uh, leaving the European wor Union working out for you so far? At the moment, well, I'll be quite honest, with you, Nick. At the moment, I I, I feel there's there's no difference. I, I'm not losing anything as as we stand right now. Well, you probably are, James. It's just that you don't notice it because somebody hasn't knocked on your door and taken something from you. But it's like small. It it, it as a People think that it's you're going to notice the difference because it'll be like slamming into a wall, but it won't. It'll be just yeah. like the slow puncture of a tire. I, look, look I, look, I totally understand where you're coming from. I know your point of view. My point of view is, look, I, I voted to leave. I didn't want to be part of a super state. Nothing, nothing else. Nothing else. That was the reason. Um, but that, that that's next. not, I mean, I really don't want to have a, that conversation, but yeah, it's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's not that really next. a I'm reason. Probably, I don't want yeah, to be I'm part probably. of a super state, but, but you are, you're, you're part of the United Kingdom. That is, yeah, you know. Yeah, which is, which is, you know, I fought for this country. I've, I've been to war for this country three times, but I agree with you on more things, Nick, but that's the only thing. Look, I cannot bring myself to vote for the Labour Party who would drop the voting age just to get a referendum to go back into maybe um, the color, you know, like the uh, what's it called, the economic union um, or the single market. OK, well, they have, uh, they've never said anything of the kind. But why? But, but why shouldn't they drop the voting age? People who are 16 can have a political opinion, which is just as valid as somebody who is 90. Why not? Yeah, but to, to me, that, that that's not the case. You've got to be you've got to be basically 18. You've no, got well, to, I, there's, uh, uh, there's absolutely nothing to suggest that that's true. I mean, somebody yeah, well, somebody who's 108 and is, yeah. has uh, lost touch with their faculties a good long while ago, they can they vote. But somebody vote. who is they, they 16 and didn't. switched on yeah. and uh, and is uh, politically motivated, they can't. I know. Look, look, look we're never going to agree on it. Right? OK, well, then we'll just leave it there. Thanks, James. I don't see why people who are 16 shouldn't be able to vote. Why not? They have to live here. They have to live with the consequences a lot longer than somebody who's 100. They can vote. Uh, let's have... Uh, Bletchingly. Hello, Mark. Hi. Mark. Hello. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, I, w I was actually going to comment on the last caller, but um, no, I'll leave that. <laughs> well, about daylight time. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Years ago, we actually tried it once. Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And the farmers complained. Oh, Everyone complained. God. The farmers. What difference does it make to farming? Cows don't know what time it is. No, well, precisely. In fact, I would have seen it as they've got more hours, and well, yeah. the parents it... complain about kiddies going to school in the dark. Oh. Well, you go home in the dark, or you come back in the dark. Precisely. It what you do. Yeah. Um, it, it's rubbish. I mean, keep changing this time screws us all up. It does. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, the accidents go through the roof around about the time that the clocks change yeah. twice a year. Uh, yeah. I mean, because pe I mean, people are just people are wandering around in a daze. They don't know whether they're up or down. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so ridiculous. And it's time they stopped it. It but is. There you go. Yeah. It ain't going to happen, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> my, my main point is um, this year is the first time I've decided... I'm not voting for anyone because what? Yeah, what? What for? Oh, come on now! What for? You have to vote. Pick what one. For? What for? Mike, um, if you say what Labour for Party, one more time, yes. Do me a favour. The Labour Party, do me a favour. Okay, all yeah, right. Do, no, do me a favour. I'm not going to vote for them. Right. Okay. Why with not? Keir Starmer, I cannot stand. Why not? Because he's detestable. In what way? Because he's arrogant. He's arrogant? Yeah. He's... What makes you say that? Well, the way he speaks. <laughs> the way he puts things across. He's arrogant. He's arrogant. He is a lawyer. Yeah. But right? ha half, the, half the cabinet are lawyers. Direction. Now, Boris, look, I think he's had a hard time. Oh, and people please. People don't realise it. He has had a hard time. Are you kidding me? What, how, how has he had a hard time? He's been having the time of his life. <laughs> well, you, you've got to take a bit of fun in between, haven't you? If not, where do you stand? Look, he's had Brexit to try and finish off. 
Then we had the coronavirus. Well, the, that, the Brexit that he had an oven-ready deal, ready to go, then oh, yeah, it's, know, it's, still not, it's still yeah. not set I yet. I did that once. <laughs> well, get Brexit done, he said, and it's still not done. Yeah, but who else is going to... Who else is going to sort anything out? I mean, the Labour Party have failed every time they've been in. In what way? Well, they've left us with unemployment through the roof. No. Empty coffers. No. No? Well, not compared to the Conservative Party, no. Well... You must live on a different planet to me. Well, uh, give me an instance, Mark, rather than just these vague assertions that, that it would be better if we were under the Labour Party. This is just a, a series of whatabouts. Me, no, uh, I'm not saying like, we're a, a bunch off of sounds signifying Labour. nothing. No, I'm not saying we're better off under the Labour. I'm saying we're worse off. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Well, no, you didn't. You said... All right, so I misspoke. Off. Obviously, you're saying we would be worse off under Labour. That's what you've just said. Yeah. Right. But you're not backing it up by by anything other than this airy ideas of, um, of um, that it would be worse. Let's say... Without actually backing any of it up. In my 74 years, Labour, even though we used to vote for them, have never done any good. Again, this is absolute nonsense, Sir Mark. This makes no sense. You you know it makes no sense. They've never done any good uh, to the NHS, for instance. Well, they started it, but they didn't get it finished very well, did they? They didn't get it finished very well. I don't know no, why I'm wasting my time, it, Mark, because great. because nothing you're saying actually makes any sense. Are you aware of that? They're just they're just sort of vague assertions uh, based on no information of any kind whatsoever. What are you talking about, man? Nick? Um... Yeah, um... Yeah, I, th I think that's it in a nutshell. Um... Yeah. OK, good idea, Mark. Don't vote. I support you in that endeavour of not voting. Ashford, hello, Lenny. Good, good evening, Nick. Lenny. Well, well, I have not voted from since from 210. Right. And and I was always a conservative. Now I have uh, I try to be an honourable person, and my vote means something to me. And I will not put my cross next to anyone I've got no confidence in. Right. So I have not voted a pure principle that I will not put my cross next to someone I've got any faith in. Just for the sake of voting, uh, so I don't vote. But let me ask you this about that. How much research into all of the different parties do you actually do? Or do you just get a feeling? No, I, uh, I, 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 took, I started taking an interest in politics in 210. And, uh, and I tried to... Because I've got uh, my health is not the best that 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 that, that, as, that I would like. Uh, I'm restricted, so to keep on things that I can do. Yeah. So what I do is I, I to keep my brain occupied. I now take a very big interest in politics. Okay. So you you do actually inform yourself about the positions of uh, each uh, leader of each party and, and what they're offering the electorate. Yeah. Now, can I give you a couple of examples, please, Nick? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, I truly believe that the dispatch box is not fit for purpose, and the House is the the Speaker of the House of Commons is not fit for purpose. Yeah. Because at the dispatch box. That is where I understand, as a layman in my way, that is where uh, an MP is, is held to account. That's where he should, they should speak the truth. Yes. And it doesn't happen. And that is the home of our democracy. Now, the bit that absolutely, I, I cannot, no one can explain this to me. There can be someone lying at the dispatch box, an opposition MP tells him he's lying and the opposition MP is telling the truth 
he gets thrown out the chamber, mm. and the one who's lying is allowed to stay. Yes, that, that is a pretty uh, accurate uh, description of what happens on virtually a daily basis that the House is sitting, yeah. That is it. And my, my, my definition of an MP is, an honor, is a honourable person that they all talk about honour, but they lie. Yeah, so it's, it's the, a dishonourable, supposedly honourable person. That's, yeah, and, they're not and, all the same. I do understand there right. are some good MPs. We, you mustn't tar all of them with the same brush. That's right. But let me ask you this, Lenny. I mean, is it not possible? Okay, so you, you haven't found the perfect candidate in uh, 10 years, but could you not just vote for somebody who is the least worst? Uh, no, because... If, if there is something about them that I do not like, mm. I mean, then I will not put my cross right. next to their name. So you're after perfection. <laughs> no, no, not perfection. But what it is, it's confidence. Right. OK, and you haven't found it lately. I, I completely understand. Thanks, Lenny. Gold is green. Hello, Daniel. Yes, hello. Daniel. Yeah, yeah, how you doing? Great, mate. Yeah, all right. Well, I just wanted to give you an informed lesson on the unfortunate circumstances of the UK going with Boris Johnson because he's being way too anti-Putin right now. Bor um, wait a minute. Bor Bor wait, hang on. Back up. Boris Johnson is being anti-Putin. Well, anti, yeah, anti-Putin, anti-Russia. Why do you have to be so vocal about being against the biggest super superpower? Because it's a populist opinion to be against it. To, I know. To I, mean, I mean, what has Vladimir Putin ever done wrong? Well, he's done a bit wrong, but I mean, it's not that wrong. And in a day, he did warn, he did warn NATO to not to go ahead for thirty years. They're That's right. Him, you know, he said warning, warning. Yeah. yeah so you know, at, at least and he gave us a warning before he joke, killed you know, three hundred you know, children in the bottom of a theatre. But you know, apart from oh, that, it's, on, it's everyone, great. You know, big deal. So UK big deal. There are only three hundred children. Yeah, I know. Who cares? Hundred fifty thousand people in Dresden. Of course. Yeah. Who cares? Answer me. Did you have a problem with 150,000 people in Dresden? No, of course not, Daniel. The more dead people, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, exactly. So we don't have a don't don't bring your you know a moral uh, sort of 300 uh, people dead. Daniel, okay, I, I applaud the more death, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Right, you're, you're not actually listening to me. You're just you expecting what uh, what I what I what, what Do you I want to get in a conversation or not with you, not. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel spends most of his time on the Daily Mail comment section under any story. Just pick one and he'll be there. He'll have a, a, a Union Jack next to his Twitter handle. Back under your bridge, troll. Glasgow. Hello, Fraser. Uh, good evening. Or Privet Kagdala. Uh, that's my only Russian. Uh, right. Uh, my thoughts entirely. <laughs> yeah, um... By the way, see that last guy? Does that mean we're going to get like a nuclear plant in the middle of London in one of these parks right beside <laughs> Buckingham Palace or that? I, I think that that's the property prices yeah, go up. I think that's unlikely. Even though people apparently would be delighted to receive one yeah, in their neighbourhood. That's what I was thinking. It's the only thing that's really missing from the viewers, the distance. <laughs> yeah, but um, Biden, he probably has made what a bit of an error, I would imagine. You know, that if he had his time again, he probably wouldn't say the same thing. Really? But, what difference does it make, though? I mean, Vladimir Putin knows that we don't like him, that we would prefer him gone in an instant. If he would have, a, like, a, a, a mafia-style goodbye, then the world would do a little happy dance. He can't be in, in any... He can't be in two minds about that. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sure that he knows that Biden particularly doesn't like him. Uh, I'm not sure about the previous incumbent in that position. But, no, I was, uh, talk I was talking more about the rest of the planet. Oh, right. Yeah, I see. But it could also be like a bit of a call to arms for, for those in Russia. That uh, I'm quite sure that although a lot of people won't see it to his face, there'll be a lot of manoeuvring going in the background, going, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? Well, in, in <laughs> well, Russia, you mean? Yeah. Right. That, the only way to be rid of Putin uh, is from within the Russian borders. Do you know what I mean? Perhaps, I yeah. Him. Well, it's, un it's unlikely he's going to leave Russia any time soon. No. And he has that much power, you know, that possibly the people inside Russia who want him gone, uh, who want a, a more open world and not run by a complete nutter, uh, they might 
be looking outside and saying perhaps it's a little more. I mean, I know I, I doubt there's any. Uh, it's any surprise to him that that the, the likes of Biden and America don't like. Uh, well, no, of course up. that's what that's what they're pretending. They're they're pretending to be shocked that anybody would suggest to such yeah. a thing, particularly somebody in a position of power. But but they're not shocked at all. These people are beyond being shocked. They're psychopaths. Some, but so, like I do believe they have some legitimate uh, concerns. Who do you know, like the uh, the Russians. Russian people. I'm, I'm not talking about Putin, right? right? Well, the Russian but people about, do. Yeah, right enough. Yeah, when they when they see NATO's 200 miles or 300 miles from Moscow, you know that will bother some people. And well, it might if if NATO was an aggressive force, but NATO doesn't it would isn't considering invading Russia. But but remember the. They don't know that they've been they've been lied to for the last what eighty years, ninety right. years, whatever, maybe longer. Okay, but but so, they're they're not conducting this war. Vla Vladimir Putin is conducting yeah. this war, and he knows that yeah. full well. But but there is support for Putin because they think he's a bit, you know, he's a bit of a, a man, as it were. He's a bit of a boy. But it, 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 I don't see. I, I I don't disagree with you. Nick. I think you're obviously you know way more than me, but it's. I've got people I know in Moldova, I've been there, and it's already, although it's not been invaded, it's white blonde haired guys that have got the money, and that happens in virtually every, which was a satellite country of Russia, you know, the, the former USSR, they still have a lot of the world out there annexed within uh, independent countries, they take the rich bit, the good bit, the bit of Transnistria in Moldova, it's where the good wine comes from, and the Russians like their wine and their brandy from there. Uh, Georgia, they've still got the the important businesses there are run by white blonde haired guys, not the locals. Right. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> I don't really know what the colour of people's hair has got anything to do with it, or, or what you're saying is that neo Nazis run the wine business in Moldova. I, I'm not quite sure what you're on about there, Fraser, but um, I appreciate the call. But first is a call in Stanwell. Hello, Michael. Hello, uh, Nick. How are you, how you doing? Good, thanks. Do you hear me properly? I can, loud and clear. Excellent. Okay, um, I, w I was bringing up about the NHS, but the people have phoned out. I'm, I'm not going to be racist or, or I'm not going to swear. Uh, people have phoned in about religion and, and whatever else. Um, I'm, I'm reading uh, the, the Ten Commandments, and, and this is not what I rung in about. But um, what I find quite irritating is the fact that in the First Commandment, he says, God, Yahweh, says that I am God, I'm a jealous God. And if you bow down to another God, um, he's going to visit inquiry onto the... <laughs> onto the third and fourth generation of the fathers, um, which is going to punish the children. OK, are, can, I, can, I, can I stop you there? OK. This, you, this isn't actually what you called in about, is it? it not at all, but I, I, I'm just irritated by people talking about religion and being racist and nasty. Um, but I, I just wanted to point that out. That, what, that, what's odd about the, the Ten Commandments is that I think... Nia, I can't remember them off the top of my head. Um, right. But um, I think like at least three or four of them are the same. Like, don't to disrespect God. Yeah, well, he, um, he's he could, have just said it, could have just said it once. But anyway, let's not um, go down that path. Not I, interested. No, not at all. No, but the fact that he says he's jealous is one of the, you know, the, yeah, the right, sins. Are we the, still talking about it? <laughs> no, okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, the reason I phoned in, Nick, um, is my, my partner works in the NHS. Um, and she works in a department and um, throughout the you know the situation of COVID, everything's been bad, people have been off. Um, but since all the restrictions have been lifted, um, you know, everywhere, um, they've got worse within the NHS. Um, but they've only got worse for managerial people um, where they can take more time off and slow down um, the, uh, the process, it would seem. Um, and, and my partner said to me that, that the, the doctors are, it's almost like they want the NHS to fail because their, their salaries, if it goes privatised, the salaries are going to go twice as much as what they are now. Um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and that's what it, it looks like. It's like, you know, the people higher up are trying to make things really hard for the people lower down and blame them for things going wrong. Mm. 
Well, you understand I'm, what I, I understand what you're saying. I, I'm not sure I entirely buy it. Um, I, I, I kind of doubt that it's the management of the NHS who are causing the uh, slow unraveling of the service. It's probably got more to do with the fact that it's been underfunded for the last 12 years. I mean, compared with the uh, Labour government before, who was spending something of the order of 6% above inflation, it plummeted to almost nothing at all. And if you're only uh, increasing it by inflation, that means that you're not really increasing it at all. That's, that's a decrease in the funding because uh, medical procedures get more expensive with every passing day and we're all getting older. But um, I, d I do get the sense that they're trying to make it as, uh, as, as difficult to access as possible so that if you have any money, you will skip the NHS and just go and buy your, your you know, whatever you need privately. Give you um, the, uh, get you used to the idea. That seems to be the plan. If, if that is not the plan and they're really, really busting a gut to make the NHS as best, as, it, as good as it possibly can be, then they're doing a really bad job. Very, very bad. So it's either um, conspiracy or a cock up select uh thanks michael greenford low paul hello nick yeah i think the tesco meal deal's gone up by 50 pence to 350 but this they might have a winning formula for the next election they've put up everything apart from national insurance so that goes in the face of that plan but i don't know do they know what they're doing you know but yeah who tesco's or the government Oh, the government. Yeah, Tesco's know what they're doing, but uh, yeah. as for the government, not not so sure. I think the jury's out. Actually, it's it's come back in again. <laughs> yeah, I think we know the answer to that. Lester, Helen. Hi, Nick. Helen. Um, I'm a bit afraid to phone you because you're a wee bit cutthroat, but I'll go for it. <laughs> okay, <go on. laughs> Um, I heard you on uh, the radio, um, I think it was last night, and uh, you were talking about houses with no heating, draft day, no yeah. installation. Right. And I was I was actually going to accuse you of being in my house when I wasn't here. Oh right. Because that's how, that's how I live. That is my house you described last night. And um Rachel was on the radio yesterday. I seen Boris in uh Ukraine and I was quite annoyed um, him standing beside such a courageous man and them having to obviously secure his safety when they're dealing with so much of their own. Right. And I phoned in to Rachel, who I have great admiration for, but she was quite cutthroat about it and sort of hemmed me off. Hmm. Um, and she was on today. It was quite obvious she was quite annoyed on radio today. And she was on and <laughs> she was saying, you know, should families be able to be slated um, if they're related to somebody that's in the public eye? Yes, and I was tempted it, to, I it was depends. Tempted to phone in. Yeah. yeah, I was tempted to phone in and then it was obvious she wasn't in good form. And I thought, no, I'm not. Um, but, you know, the, I didn't know that Rachel was Boris Johnson's sister. The first time I ever seen her, she was on a chef's program. And I thought, she is so down to earth. She's brilliant. And, you know, if, if Rachel was fully... Where is this no going? Say, okay. <laughs> well, that took a swerve that I wasn't expecting. Um, thanks for that, Helen. Whatever that was. Uh, Snodland. David. Good evening. Yes, sir. Doesn't uh, Snodland sound like the kind of place that Jacob Rees-Mogg would come from? You're better informed than I am. I don't know anything. Yes. It, it, it might be, yeah. It's uh, quite a quirky little village here near Maidstone. Snodland. It sounds awful. Yeah, actually, I've actually Googled it, and snod means flat. Right. But it's not flat here. But it's not flat. No, is it the not. kind of thing like Greenland and Iceland to, you know, give the uh, the, the enemy the swerve? Well, who knows? They think fair, um, Iceland sounds terrible. Let's go to Greenland instead, whereas uh, Greenland is covered in ice and Iceland is uh, covered in... Oh, I've got no idea. It's covered it in... Well, it's covered in green. <laughs> it's covered in, gre in geysers. Exactly. But anyways, Andy, the, the reason I've rung you tonight and, and you're... The, the person who answered the phone to me knew me by name, so quite fantastic. Did anyway, you just, no, did you just, by the way, did you just call me Andy? An echoing silence. Did I get it wrong? 
I'm not Andy. Oh, he's called the wrong bloke. He's probably called the wrong station. Who are you, who are you calling? Well, we'll see if we can find them for you. Well, I was calling LBC, but if I'm honest with you, I'm, I'm terrible with names. <laughs> so I do apologize. No, that's okay. Right. Well, what is your name then? Oh, mate, it doesn't really matter. Get on with it. All right, then. Well, as I said, I do apologize. Um, I, I was born in, in California to English parents, so I, I w went to the supermarket earlier, and um, I caught a bit of your show, and uh, you were talking wait about... Wait a minute, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. You were born to... Run that by me again. I was born in California. You were born in English California parents. to English parents, so you went to the supermarket earlier. I I'm not sure how the two are connected. <laughs> there seems no. to be a big gap... <laughs> <laughs> in between we, we'll, we'll just fill in that gap in our imaginations okay well i can tell if you like no no i, th I don't think we've got time uh, to be honest all right fair enough anyways i was off to the supermarket earlier yes i've been in the uk since 97 by the way this is the um, first time you've been to the supermarket go on what did you get well i bought so, enough the last 25 years did you, you get some <laughs> spotted dick disgusting that usually amuses <laughs> americans yeah, that yeah, definitely. Oh, of course. Okay, well that's great. Thanks a lot. Uh, whatever your name is, what an excellent call. But sadly, you you know we've uh, we've run right out of time. So sad. I am distraught. Brentford, Mustafa. Very good evening, Nick. Yes, sir. Good man. Are you okay? Yeah, good. Thanks. Good, good. Um, to be honest with you, I don't agree with uh, with with American policy in the first place, and with uh, with what uh, Biden said today. I think they should. If no, but no country has a right to interfere in any other country. If the Russians are not happy with the president, they should do whatever it takes to remove him. I think America should not, or England for that matter, should not put their nose in this matter. Look what's happened in in uh, in Iraq for the America. And England, what they said about Saddam. He has nuclear power, he, he, can, he can launch it within 45 minutes, day and night, day and night. And now after all, after killing 3 million people, what they said, we apologize, our secret service got it wrong. I think it's playing with fire when you try to interfere with other country. No, you I think that, sure. wait a minute, hang on, back up. You think that Biden is playing with fire? I, I think so. I think it's for his own interest. I don't think he really cares about the 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 uh, any other country for that matter. Look, see, I don't buy that. But you, even uh, if he didn't care about any other country, what Vladimir Putin is doing is holding the entire all... planet uh, to ransom if we don't give him everything he wants, which is just a, a free card to destroy people's lives and uh, execute children and women and men in the tens of thousands and reduce cities to rubble. If we don't let him just get, go ahead and do it, then he's going to kill us all. So even if uh, uh, Joe Biden was only thinking about America, then what happens to America also happens to the rest of the world. But like I said before, He's doing that. Putin is doing that, threatening the lives of six billion people. But we can't um, express a, an opinion that it would be better if he didn't do that because it would be rude. Enfield. Hello, Mike. Hi there. Um, all these huge companies that export their profits as management fees to Luxembourg and the Seychelles and other, co other countries, there should be a cap on it, 5% of the gross profit, something like that, instead of uh, bashing the the oil companies whose dividends go to support so many pensions. And the other thing is the LTNs cause us extra mileage using extra petrol and the jams and the roads that have to be repaired all the time. You know, it's, it's out of all proportion. Well, low traffic neighborhoods is not really uh, something that's going to impact people's uh, financial lives, particularly well, much of the only a small my, beer, isn't my, it? Okay, my tires, for instance, keep on getting cut up because of all the potholes and the, and the, and the, uh, the time to get to the hospitals and all other places is twice as long. Yeah, yeah I, I, again, I think that's just kind of, um, that's uh, pr that small change uh, you're concentrating on uh, there, Mike. Let, let's the, the, see if we can uh, concentrate on the bigger picture. Your tires keep getting cut up. Enfield, hello, Mike. 
Hi there. Um, Mr. Johnson is quite happy to leave England when, when, when it gets too hot. And that's the reason I think he's got over there. Because he has the pro every time there's a problem, he disappears abroad. The other thing about this woman you were talking to and prices of houses, if you get 200,000 uh, houses wanted every year from the indigenous population, the British, and you've got people coming over from Hong Kong and from Europe, of course house prices will continue to rise. There's no nothing nothing you can stop unless you build 50,000, uh, 500,000 houses in a year. It'll continue to rise. So she's talking out of the back of her head. Uh, well, I don't think that that's fair at all. Um, but uh, we have over the last uh, 30 some years, well, since the war, actually, since the Second World War, uh, built in some years zero new houses. Uh, whereas Germany seems to be able to build a quarter of a million a year over and over and over again, year after year after year. And that's probably why there doesn't, uh, to my knowledge, appear to be a housing crisis in Germany, whereas the, there is in this country, because um, they, we just haven't built enough houses. Obviously. Lancaster, Davida. Hello, Nick. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to take issue with you on the, this uh, idea that Putin is mad. He's not mad. He's just trying to expand Russia's uh, influence and geography, basically. But on, on Biden, Biden is a liability. You'd, not even Biden knows what's going to come out of his mouth, never mind the White House staff, never mind the rest of the world. It is a liability. He can't even walk down a red carpet without assistance, practically. What do you think, mate? Um, <laughs> I think you've given it a lot of thought, uh, Davida. Thanks. <sighs> Woodford, hello, Hussein. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Nick. Um, well, I was actually a Labour supporter. I used to vote Labour. And when we had the protest in central London against the Iraq war, um, that's when I kind of completely lost uh, faith in Labour and then started to vote Tory. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see why I, I would ever vote uh, Labour again, especially seeing their stance on, you know, the lockdowns and um, Brexit. And I just... I just feel like conservatives are more reliable. I mean, they promised Brexit, they delivered it. Well, not they really. They, they haven't delivered it, Brexit because they're still negotiating it. Yeah, they are. But in like, they were the only party that said they were actually going to deliver it, where Labour really didn't know where they were standing on the whole issue. Well, I mean, even but, with but, lockdowns. But again, I mean, they said they were going to deliver it, but they haven't. They also said that it was going to mean cheaper food and cheaper clothes and uh, cheaper shoes and that it was going to be a higher uh, wages and it was going to mean lower gas and electricity bills, all of which were lies. But all those, all those reasons that you're stating at the moment is actually also relevant in the United States because inflation of 7% going on in uh, there now, there's actually a world issue at the moment with prices going up. It's not a Brexit thing. Well, no, um, even I, though, I'm aware of that, but Bre Brexit... Brexit isn't helping, and again, we were promised by the people but, that insisted but, that we vote to leave the European Union that all of those the, things would the, be the consequence, and Nick, they're not. Nick, the prices in the prices in the European Union are also rising. It's not just something that's happening entirely in the UK. Well, I'm aware I mean, of that as well, but let's take what France is doing with gas and electricity. One of the things that we were promised to when if we uh, left the European Union were lower gas and electricity bills. They said we will I, be able Able to I, I, cut the VAT on gas and electricity if only we could agree, leave the evil socialist to... superstate that is the European Union. And in yeah, France, they are having a 4% cap on the That's increase right. in That's their right. fuel bills. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we need a new energy policy, and I do think we need to go back to nuclear, uh, nuclear energy. I think that all this green energy stuff hasn't actually helped. And I think the Tories have actually understood that as well now, and I think they would make that shift. But um, but they've been in power point. for 12 years. I mean, yes, they, they, have, they knew I that just, they I, knew that we, even Labour, regardless of this war in Ukraine, they knew that we had a, a catastrophe coming, that we might not be able to keep the lights on, and up for 12 years they didn't do anything about it. That, no, I, I agree. I, but think, well, you seem to, to be agreeing with me a lot. <laughs> but all of sorry, the things that I'm saying Labour, might persuade you not to vote Conservative, and, and yet I, I, don't, I, I, don't I don't see, see what basis... 
I don't, I don't see what basis have you have for voting Conservative if you, if you agree I with just, everything that I've just said. I just don't see Labour having a better policy than them on these right. issues either. They just, especially what, what they've done to Jeremy Corbyn. I was kind of hopeful when Jeremy Corbyn came, came into power. And then um, uh, the, what they've done to him and how they undermined him and just took him down and accused him of all this anti-Semitic sort of Well, you, you, don't, you don't think that that was actually the Tory run offshore billionaire press that did that. You think it was the Labour Party that did that? Labour Party was also involved. There was also members of, uh, there was MPs of Labour Party that was actually the <laughs> accusing of Jeremy Corbyn of anti-Semitism. No, I'm just, I just, th I just never thought this, the, the guy don't look racist himself whatsoever. I just thought he was a genuine guy, not a corrupt guy. Um, he had his principles. I thought he was going to turn Labour Party around, take him Labour Party back to his roots, you mm -hmm. know. And well, then all well, of a yeah, sudden... you, and, you and me both. But OK, um, I'm going to have to go because I'm past the break. But you've um, you, you've made your decision and you are sticking to it. Thanks, Hussein. Joining me now is Margaret Holder, who is a royal author, writer and a broadcaster. Thanks for your time this morning, Margaret. Hi there, Nick. Would you say that Harry and Meghan actually resonate more with young people and that the, the choices that Harry and Meghan have made seem more relatable to young people? You know, the, the causes that they espouse and they're just the, 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 the lack of, um, uh, you know, the, the glitz and the horses and the feathers and all of that uh, folder all that comes with uh, the royals in this country. They, they're just celebrities now. Do you think that that is actually what we're looking at as the future of the royal family? They just they just become celebrities. Um, I'm not convinced, first of all, that that young people necessarily sympathise with Harry and Meghan. I mean, there may be elements of what they they said they went through that resonate. There, there are lots of questions about what they actually accuse the royal family of. Um, and some people, young and old, did feel that the timing, for example, of the Oprah Winfrey interview was wrong because the whole family knew that Prince Philip had come out of hospital and he was going home to die peacefully at Windsor. And that the whole family knew that, that the, the doctors had reached the end of their treatment. There was nothing more that could be done. Everybody hoped he would make a hundred. He didn't. But it, it wasn't a very nice thing to do for Harry because his grandfather had always had his back and the, the royal grandparents had done quite a bit for him, had helped him a lot. But, you know, they went ahead and did it. So... I don't think there's that much sympathy. Unfortunately, there, there are people with a different agenda who support Harry and Meghan and make accusations uh, to people who don't support them. But but, but, give, a, but just putting that writer. aside, just for one moment. But Sorry. what about the the idea of you know the future of the royal family is uh, is not horse drawn carriages and uh, you oh, know, no, no, glittery no, no. hats and all that. They're just celebrities. Uh, yes, uh, they, they probably do see them as more Hollywood celebrities now because uh, they've gone to live in California. Um, it's hard to say the way it will go because you look at Charles and Camilla now and if you actually look at pictures of the Queen and Philip at their age, they look younger, they look more vital. Uh, Philip certainly had so much more about him uh, 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 you know, to, as a man, to, you would look at him. Uh, even if you didn't like him, you you would still would hardly ignore him. But th these, they look. Uh, uh, even every every, I think every day that passes, they look like an elderly couple already. Mm. Uh, so, so I don't so think maybe they're, they're ever ahead. have the glamour. No, uh, ahead in that regard. Yes, uh, thanks, Margaret. That's Margaret Holder a royal author, writer, and broadcaster. Stoke Newington. Hello, Keith. Ah, uh -huh, Nick. Good Keith. evening. Keith. <laughs> Listen, I'm sorry to tell you, but I think your philosophy about uh, socialism and the Labour Party being great is totally and utterly flawed for a very simple reason. The only way you can achieve good socialism is through good capitalism, which creates wealth and spreads it amongst the people. The Labour Party and all socialist countries have never 
ever achieved that. And well, they can't well achieve which, that. which capitalist countries? I mean, we, we haven't achieved that. Scandinavian countries have, perhaps, but they are run on a more sort of socialist basis than we are. Yeah, well, they're highly taxed, highly taxed, right. and they never make any real commercial progress at all. No, yes, the however, they do have a happier population. Which is more important? Well, I don't think they do have a happier well, population. Well, they do. They absolutely verifi they they verifiably do. Year after year after year, the happiness index comes out, and it's always the same countries at the top. It's not an accident. Well, you know, I, I, disagree. I can't see any evidence of that. You're saying that, but where's the evidence? The, the evidence, I mean, as I just described, is printed on a yearly basics, basis. It's called the happiness index. It rates... Uh, each country is based on polls that are taken within that country on people's happiness on a wide variety of uh, different markers and it is always the same countries at the top and it's never us well what, one of the other reasons for that perhaps is because when we were in the eu we were paying we were paying 40 billion pounds a year to keep them all financed and when we stopped paying that it came out they all started screaming and shouting and demanded money for us correct keith you can't possibly after all this time still be so misinformed as to think that that's the case that you still don't know that we paid a thousand we paid a hundred in and got a thousand out you still you can't possibly after all this time have picked up so little information that you are still propounding that uh, argument but I guess so. Painful, really. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Never mind. <laughs> it's just life. Anyway, in an unrelated story, Rishi Sunak's wife, um, Akshata Murthy, bowed to pressure to pay UK taxes. With the Sunak's position under increasing threat, Murthy said she realised that many people felt her tax arrangements were not compatible with her husband's job as Chancellor, adding that she appreciated the British sense of fairness. <laughs> and I think we can all relate to that, because who hasn't decided to pay taxes that are due on what they earn in this country on the basis that avoiding them isn't compatible with their other half's job? Oh, that's right, we don't get to choose whether we pay taxes. Taxes are taken from our wage before we even get it. There is no choice. And that is because we were stupid enough not to have been born to a billionaire. We only have ourselves to blame. Mrs. Fishy will pay tax on all worldwide income in future and for the last tax year, but not on backdated income, which could have saved her an estimated £20 million pounds of UK tax on foreign earnings from her billionaire father's Indian IT company. So she's paying some tax, hypothetically, assuming that there are any earnings that are subject to tax in the future, but not on the actual money that she has come into in the past. Well, I certainly hope that there won't be any massive reduction in her income that might be subject to tax in the future, because that would be unexpected. So she's gracefully elected to pay what a normal person in the street would think of as being potentially aligned to what could be called her fair share. And that's an end to it, isn't it? No. No, you bet your life it's not. I wonder whether the rush to get us out of the European Union at all costs was in any way related to the Conservative Party's fervent desire to avoid any EU clampdown on non-DOM status and tax avoidance and the regulatory havens of impenetrable darkness that are the British overseas territories. I mean... Do you have any thoughts on that, Smug? You're better informed than I am. I don't know anything. He doesn't know anything. He's claiming ignorance. I believe him. Well, ordinarily. But on this particular issue? Eh, I'm not so sure. Meanwhile, it appears as though the captain of our ship, the SS Britannia, wasn't even on board for a lot of the time that he was supposed to be our skipper. Fishy was forced to confirm that he had a US green card meaning that he had declared himself a permanent U.S. resident for tax purposes for 19 months while he was Chancellor and for six years as an MP. What? <laughs> six years. <laughs> uh. 
I mean, that's worse than working on an island tax haven against the interests of the government that you're supposed to be representing while voting on parliament business by remote control. And that was perfectly legal as well, while earning four million pounds doing it. It's almost as though the law is one of those fairground height signs that said you must be at least this rich to go on this ride. A source close to the couple also confirmed that his wife held the green card as well. Wow. I mean, the super rich, they, they don't appear to exist except as golden auras of loveliness and are just as hard to nail down. Holders of green cards, by the way, they're required to make a legal commitment to make the US their permanent home. And they held them while, while Rishi Sunak was an MP for, did I say six years? Something like that. 19 months while he was our Chancellor. The disclosure that they both had US green cards appears at odds with Sunak's defense of his wife being a non-dom. He said she intended to one day return to live in India. Maybe he misspoke. Maybe he meant Indiana. But it's worse than that because just as Captain Fishy was hiking the taxes for us little people, not leprechauns, hiking it up to record levels to make up the gap in our finances that were caused by this government. The Treasury last week brought in a new low tax scheme designed to benefit wealthy non-DOM investors. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Did you know about that? The new laws specifically mention fund manager non-DOMs as a category of people who can benefit by not having to pay tax on foreign earnings through the new vehicles. What an incredible coincidence. I wonder if there's anyone in the regime that knows someone like that. A donor, perhaps, or a close personal friend, maybe. Any thoughts, Bodger? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, 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 wait. He's thinking about it. Meanwhile, Bodge is uh, on manoeuvres because, uh, you know, he can only say Sue Gray so many times to deflect questions about his incessant partying while his citizens were dying. And in a press conference on Friday, Bodger admitted that he had not been told about Murty's non-dom status, but he denied anyone at number 10 was briefing against the Sunaks. He praised the Chancellor for doing an outstanding job, which in political speak means that he's probably out in the next reshuffle. Unless he's got the keys to the skeleton cupboard, in which case he'll be in the House of Lords instead, literally lording it over us for life. That's how it works, isn't it, Gavin? I, 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 I believe it is. Downing Street Insiders revealed that an away day last week descended into acrimony between number 10 and number 11 aides over the source of the Murty leak and long-standing tensions over the Partygate scandal. <laughs> acrimony between aides. Can these people hear themselves? My people are very cross with your people. I'm going to have to send them a memo. Oh, no. <laughs> Tory MPs believed it was possible that Bodger could seek to move Fishy from the Treasury in a summer or autumn reshuffle if he survives the current crisis threatening his chancellorship. And, um, and if Boris Johnson survives that long, he will have about as much authority to sack anyone as the Downing Street cat. <laughs> God, what a shower. And it just goes on and on and on. No wonder Bodger skipped the country. Joining us to discuss whether the Chancellor has any political capital left is Harry Phipps, writer for Conservative Home website. Hello, Harry. Hello. This is all very embarrassing, isn't it? Yes, and I think it um, must be difficult for Rishi Sunak to adjust, having had this huge popularity and now sort of coming down to earth with uh, quite a lot of political and um, media hostility. So... Uh, I suppose character building is the most positive way of looking at it. Well, if that's what it's doing to him, it, does, it appears to have missed him entirely because he's packed his bags and said, right, that's it, I'm leaving. Yes, I'm not sure that's particularly um, um, significant. In a way, I feel if he was leaving in the sense of actually uh, resigning, which, which we saw was reports that he was um, seriously considering, you know, in a way, I think that that... Um, decision would have happened now and so I think that um, my my guess is that probably he will now um, you know hang on in there and um, 
and, and survive, but, you know, as, as a sort of mere mortal, instead of this stratospheric um, popularity, having to live like, <laughs> live like a normal um, politician and, and, and cope with, uh, with, with some of the pressures that, uh, that some of his cabinet colleagues are, uh, are used to, really, in terms of sort of hostile coverage. Well, his popularity is now almost as low as the Prime Minister's himself. Um, do you think that that's perhaps because the public knows more about him now? I think the important point really is uh, the, the substance in terms of what his, what his policies are. And the difficulty really is that he's been saying that he believes in low taxes, but he hasn't actually been delivering. We've got, even after the, the pandemic now, we hope is sort of more or less over, we've still got government spending going up and tax going up. And so particularly for conservatives who feel that they, you know, that they should be about trying to have more individual freedom and about us being able to choose how we spend our money rather than the state taking our money and spending it for us. Uh, you know, conservatives particularly will feel, you know, well, what's the point of that? And of course, also, um, so voters generally, if, if you get uh, cost of living pressure, uh, then, then people start to think, well, actually, one of the big cost of living is the amount taken from us, uh, from, the, from the government. And so that people who might, who might be more um, relaxed about, about some of these things, if there's, if there's sort of pressure meeting the bills, then they start to get rather more concerned about the um, tax burden. So, you know, he's sort of got away with it for a while, putting up our tax, and now... Uh, people have got got wise to it, and so I think that's more more than the stuff about um, you know his wife and the non dom status and the green card status. It's you know it's 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 actually the substance of what he's doing that's the um, the real problem. Well, he's he claims to be a low tax chancellor. Maybe he meant for himself. I mean, he didn't actually make it specific that he was talking about the rest of us. Maybe he had himself in mind. It's pretty well, extraordinary, isn't it? When his wife said, "This is her." Uh, comment. She announced that she would start paying UK taxes because her arrangements were not compatible, her word, with her husband's job as Chancellor. So before we found out about it, apparently it was compatible. Well, it's a difference, isn't it, between things being legal and, and things being uh, passing the smell test and being um, politically acceptable. So, you know, I think it's legal. And I think, I think also that probably, um, you know, for many decades has been this non-DOM status. And presumably that's because chancellors, both Labour and Conservative, when they sat down with their officials, have, have been told, look, if we, if we uh, bash the rich... Uh, too much. It's you know great uh, newspaper headlines and make people feel good, but wouldn't actually be a benefit in terms of raising more revenue because um, because you drive people away. So it's counterproductive. So unless you're doing it for purely sort of envy and political reasons, rather than for rather than for sort of practical reasons, it you know it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So you know I think from that point of view, um, it it's it, it, you know that's that's. Fair enough. But I think that the difficulty, as I say, really is um, that, that here's somebody who's, who's, who's very rich and his wife is even more rich. And people might be prepared to say, uh, you know, if things are going well, think, oh, well, fine, you know, good for him. But if, if people are feeling under pressure and you think, well, look, here's somebody who's piling on extra taxes, then I think that's, that's when the, the, you know, the mood is a bit more resentful, isn't it? Yeah, well, I know it's um, the, the usual riposte when anybody who is not a billionaire has the temerity to uh, question someone who is in their various labyrinthine uh, financial uh, position. But politics of envy, I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's pretty weak. We're, we are, are we not, pretty much the only country that does this, this non-DOM thing. It hasn't really affected the finances of other countries who are doing better than us oh uh i think our, our tax our tax arrangements are um uh, are, are, are much more complicated than they should be i mean i think it'd be much better to have um a, a simpler tax and to have uh, you know to have, have lower tax um for rich and the poor and by the way i think that this is it's important to say that this argument about incentives and and rewarding um hard work and rewarding innovation i mean that should apply right across the scale and of course we've got other uh, 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 people on universal credit uh you know when they when they do uh, some extra hours work and get um, paid some extra money an awful lot of that is 
lost in benefits. And, and you know, so I think that a proper conservative approach should be to say, we, you know, we want we want low tax and incentives across the board, and that would be that would be a much better approach. And then you wouldn't really need to rely on all these. Um, uh, special arrangements to try and Loop to try holes. and attract billionaires, you know, cause, because because you'd have, if you had a simple competitive low tax uh, mm. s- system, that would be a, that would be a much more straightforward um, way of proceeding. Yeah, but after you know, this is if the Conservative Party wanted to do something about this, they've had twelve years. I mean, how long does it take? I think our tax code runs to tens of thousands of pages. I think um, si- is, is it Singapore's or Hong Kong runs to three hundred and fifty. The, the reason that it is so complicated is so that people just like Rishi Sunak can employ buildings full of genius accountants to comb through it and find the sort of loopholes that ordinary people like you and me couldn't have a hope of finding. Well, you're, you're very cynical. I think, that, uh, I think that we could and should have a simpler tax system and we could, you know, we absolutely could be slashing the tax code. Obviously, we've now left the European Union, so that's no longer um, an alibi for, for, for um, some of the complexity that was being imposed from then. And I, I, I think it's, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's Rishi Sunak sort of cackling away and thinking that it's all a great, um, wonderful treat for um, billionaires having the, having the complexity. I, I, uh, but I, I do think it's something that has got worse and worse and worse for years, for decades. And I do think that for a, a genuine conservative government that believes in reducing the role of the state, although it might be very boring, um, it's an important job to not just cut tax, but simplify tax. And, you know, I hope that if that this sanitary experience might might get him to sort of focus on on delivering. If he wants to be a successful politician, he needs to get on with 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 delivering on that agenda. What do you make of uh, the fact that he rose, uh, r- raised taxes on the rest of us while bringing in a tax exemption for non-DOM hedge funders? Well, um, I, I don't know the details of that. What I do know is that overall, tax has gone up uh, for the for the rich and the poor and the and the middle earners, and that's that's because. Um, that's because spending has gone up, and he's, uh, you know, we've got, we've still got this um, 50% top rate tax, which probably, if, if that was scrapped, we probably would have higher revenues um, uh, that, I mean, than, 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 we, than we do keeping it. Uh, we've we've got him putting up corporation tax, whereas when corporation tax that you know on business profits, when that was cut, we actually raised more uh, revenue with a lower corporation tax rate. So. Uh, you know, I just, I, I don't think it's a cynical kind of conspiracy, but I just think it's, it, it, it's bad policy, it's lazy policy to keep piling on more tax and, and piling on more regulation. What did you think when you heard about Sajid Javid's non-DOM status? Yes, I didn't think too much of that because, I mean, obviously that was, that was before he was um, a politician. But, you know, I mean, for, as, I, as I say, for many years we've had this, um, non-DOM status, and I would I would prefer that we didn't rely on that. I would prefer that we, we you know, we were we were saying to the world we're open for business, um, successful, wealthy people, absolutely good for you. But you know, come here and 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 pay your tax here, and we'll have a competitive arrangement for you, an enterprising arrangement where you have a low tax rate, and and we collect um, all the all the revenue from as many. Um, billionaires as possible, and I think that would be a better economic model than, than sort of fiddling around with all these com- complex schemes. Now, there has been um, a, a, an inquiry launched by Rishi Sunak. He, um, so thin-skinned, it's really quite remarkable that he's managed to get as far as he has. Perhaps his entire life has been handed to him on a plate, and the one small bump in the road, and um, he sort of whines like a slapped baby. He has now insisted on an inquiry into how, not into his own and his wife's affairs, but in how we got to find out about them. Yes, over the, over the leak, you mean, yes. Well, I think that's perfectly uh, uh, reasonable on principle for him to ask that. And if your, um, you know, if your tax affairs were leaked or mine, well, I think we'd probably be pretty um, annoyed and pretty, you know, pretty think, well, how on earth did that happen? I think the, I think the difficulty for him is that in practice, um, these leak inquiries 
going back, you know, we've had had this going back through the sort of, you know, the sort of yes minister type um, comedies, haven't we? That they never really get anywhere, and um, and therefore I think it's, you know, fine. He can he he can, he can do that, but I, I would be sceptical as to whether they'd find the leaker because they never really do. Well, of course, if they uh, start an inquiry, then that will let them off the hook from having to comment on anything concerning that inquiry until the qu inquiry is delivered. And as we're still waiting for that Sue Gray report, I mean, to this point, I'm not even sure Sue Gray actually exists, but <laughs> which is, they keep talking about it, but we never see it. And so it's just going to kick it into the long grass and they can uh, feel justified in saying, well, we can't say anything more about that because there's an inquiry going on. Yes, I think I would be over the, over the point about, you know, where the information had come from. I mean, he's also asked to, um, he's written to the Prime Minister to say he'd like to formally sort of, you know, be um, investigated for whether he, he broke any rules or not. And I think that's a way of him sort of heading off accusations that he had broken rules. I don't, I don't believe there's any evidence that he or his wife have broken any any rules or um, any no, any no, laws? I, I, I also I'd bet think money, I'd bet money on it because the yeah. rules are written it with him in mind. Yeah, I think it's more that um, it's, it's more that people are angry about the pressure they're under for the cost of living, and they're angry that their taxes are going up. And even though he's given us a bit of money back, that still overall the tax are going up. And so the suggestion that we should be grateful that he's he's you know he's putting up taxes a bit less than he otherwise was going to be. Uh, I mean, I think that winds people up, and I think you know pe people have people have had enough. And I think this um, uh, that you know the non don saga should probably be seen in that in that context really that it's it's the the, the um dismay about that is, is 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 really in the context of people feeling dismayed about their tax bills going up do you think people might also be dismayed that rishi sunak has ruled out an inquiry into furlough fraud he's ruled out an inquiry into ppe fraud he's ruled out an inquiry into covid loan fraud basically he's ruled out an inquiry into everything that he has been responsible for but he does want an inquiry into how we got to find out about how his wife avoids tax i think that if i think that when when people say that we've put up we, we we've got all this extra tax why is it going up and he says it's absolutely essential all the spending is essential um we, we the, all these big increases in public spending um uh, you, you know are absolutely vital i think that lacks credibility where people i mean the examples you give but i mean every day they're they're um uh, awful lot of evidence of uh, of, of money being wasted. Um, I mean, I, there's one example is the civil service is, uh, um, you know, higher than it's been for years. We've got quangos, um, not just billions, but tens of billions going on a whole array of quangos, very little accountability. Um, well, we're, you know, we're, stories we're, about we're spending a million pounds a month storing PPE that we bought over the market price from friends and donors of the regime that, because, that was unusable. I mean, well, we, we can talk about bad choices if you like. The, 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 uh, all, all, the, all the coronavirus stuff, obviously, there's um, that that was done as an, as an as an emergency spending, but I'm sure there was a lot of money that was um, wasted over, over that. But it's, it, it, I think, in a way, to focus on that is, you see, that's what that's what the chancellor would say is, oh well, we've had this this pandemic. I think the point now is that with that being over, we've now got to start thinking, right, you know, there's a trillion pounds a year of our money being spent, and the argument is that. Uh, it's impossible to find any savings. I mean, that is simply not not credible. I mean, every every day we're getting um, evidence of a lot of money being wasted, and I think for the um, Conservatives to recover their their sort of mission, their, their sense of purpose, they they need to get far more um, vigorous about saying that we need value for money and we need to look for savings and we need to make. Um, uh, sure that the um, amount of our money being taken from us and spent by the state starts to go down rather than going up and up and up. You write for the Conservative Home website. What's the feeling with the Conservative grassroots? Are they in a something of a despond? Are they sort of despairing, pulling their hair out? I mean, can they? Are they? Is there like rumblings in the ranks? Oh, I think that um, it's. 
you, you've always got different different issues involved. I mean, I think that um, in terms of Boris Johnson, there's uh, there's a lot of um, support for. Uh, him over the stance he's, he's um, taken on Ukraine and the Defence Secretary Ben Wallace and a great feeling of national pride that um, that we've been ahead of other countries in giving support to Ukraine. I mean, they're absolutely critically doing doing that months indeed. Well, um, I mean, we, we, could, we could talk about that, but I mean, I, I don't think that it's as good as your um, as you're portraying it. But um, well, I'm giving you the I'm giving you the views of, of, of Conservative Party members as right. as measured by the Conservative Home website, and I would say that there's um, you know, there's very um, strong feeling of, of, of pride among them in, in, in having a, having a conservative government that's, that that you know that, uh, that 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 they feel has been making the right calls as far as that, which obviously is a pretty important issue we're facing at the moment. Right. But in, in, in terms in terms of what you were talking about with Rishi Rishi Sunak and um, and, and tax and spend, I, you know, I think that there would be a lot of conservatives who would who, who would feel now, you know, we need to actually get get some conservative policies delivered and I think there would be some impatience over that issue. All right, Harry, thanks for that. That's Harry Phibbs, writer for Conservative Home website. So, do you have a strong sense of pride in the Chancellor and the other? He's toast, isn't he?